Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, Thursday, December the 3rd. Good this morning. conference will now be recorded. And uh, to everyone uh, that's online this morning, once again, we come to you virtually, and uh, we're going to get through today's agenda as rapidly as we can. We have some very interesting items uh, today. So uh, with that, we always uh, pause for a moment here and uh, uh, do the pledge to the flag, and then we'll also observe our moment of silence uh, to remind ourselves that there are folks on the front line of this pandemic, continue to be on the front line, uh, and uh, keep our folks uh, in law enforcement, first responders, and all those in uniform across the country and across the world to allow us to do this today. So with that, I'm going to have Commissioner Frazier lead us in today's Pledge to the Flag. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. The furling flag, yes. Thank you, Chris Swam, for the furling flag. The one here isn't furling. Probably a good thing. <laughs> that is a good thing. Good thing would mess up my hair, right? So there's that. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> okay. Uh, I've got the – hey, I'm, I see you laughing, Boucher. I don't know if you're laughing with me or at me. So we'll, we'll address that later on. Um, so uh, I've got the mask on. I will take it off uh, here in a moment. I've got it on just to remind folks that uh, – we are going to start with COVID this morning later on uh, after we get through a couple of priority Carol items. But uh, just a reminder that we, we need to remain vigilant and uh, continue the best practices as we are nowhere out of the woods yet. There is a light at the end of the tunnel uh, as we hear that vaccines could begin to arrive as early as next week. Uh, so, um, but, but uh, with that said, we need to continue to do this and we'll hear more about that uh, shortly. Uh, the first thing I want to do this morning, uh, we have a guest on the line, and uh, let's take care of that before we do our personal priority carols this morning, because uh, I don't want to hold her up, uh, and um, I'm going to turn this over uh, to Celine Steckel, our Director of, the, of, of uh, Department of Citizen Services, to pay tribute to a local business that has uh, graciously supported uh, the pro one of the uh, several of the programs over at the uh, Citizen Services, and that's Coons Toyota of Westminster. Uh, so let's take care of that one first, and uh, we'll turn it over to Celine. Celine, good morning. Good morning, Commissioners. Um, this morning we have Angela Berner on the phone with us, um, and she is with Coons Toyota of Westminster. And we w wanted to recognize her um, this morning because of the ongoing support that Coons Toyota provides to the senior centers throughout Carroll County. I'm gonna turn it over to Gina to say a few more words and also welcome Angela and thank you for being with us this morning and thank you for your support. Good morning, um, thank you Celine and, and I will be brief as well, um, but Angela, um, I wanna thank you and Coons Toyota for, as Celine said, your continued support of our senior and community centers um, for 10 years. Um, Coons Toyota has supported us and which has really um, benefited um, the people that attend our senior community centers in many ways. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Rich Otone who has some uh, additional information to share. He's um, the community services supervisor and oversees all of our senior centers. Good morning and Angela, thank you uh, for joining us today. Um, I just want to once again uh, express our gratitude to Coons for their generous donation of uh, $10,000 to assist our senior centers um, in providing uh, virtual exercise class sessions and meals to our membership. Um, just to give you some numbers, between October of 2019 and March 13th, which was the last day centers were open prior to the shutdown, uh, Coons funding enabled 391 people to participate in 302 class sessions free of charge. Um, the pandemic and subsequent closure of the senior centers provided uh, significant challenges to the county's older population, uh, not the least of which was social isolation. Uh, you know, the, 
the senior centers were closed and other venues like local restaurants and gyms and other places where uh, folks would go to, to meet people weren't there anymore for them. So to combat that, our staff worked with our exercise instructors and developed a schedule for virtual class sessions Beginning in July, um, since beginning, uh, the beginning of July, 175 senior center members have been able to participate in 354 virtual class sessions. Uh, that's through the end of October. I don't have November's numbers yet. But um, all of those classes have been paid for by Coons, uh, the money that we received from Coons um, last year. And um, these classes have been well received by the uh, folks who are taking them. We continue to get emails and calls thanking us for making them available. Um, it, the big thing is that they were able to participate in classes with familiar instructors. So that um, encouraged people to um, come out, if you will, and, and join the virtual classes. Um, eventually, the centers are going to reopen. I'm confident that that's going to happen. Um, thank you for the reminder about the uh, vaccine. Um, and once they do reopen, uh, we, we absolutely anticipate that fewer people will come in of it, uh, initially. People will be nervous, um, and we'll have, I'm sure, limits placed on capacity. But nonetheless, we do plan on offering both virtual and in-person um, class sessions, which will also, um, Coons, the money that we re have received from Coons will help us pay for. Um, and also, I just want to point out that a portion of the Coons donation this year will also be used to provide meals for senior center members for various upcoming grab and go events, uh, like the one that's coming up on December 17th for Christmas, uh, Valentine's Day and other events in 2021. Um, this is the 10th year that Coons has um, honored the senior centers with a donation and we look forward to their continued support of our wonderful program. Thank you Coons and Angela for supporting our programs during these unprecedented times and sharing your belief in good health with our seniors. Well, thank you very much, Carroll County and Gina and Rich have been great when we were talking about what our donations could do, what the true needs were for the seniors of the community and really being able to, um, I mean, I'm impressed with Carroll County and their efforts for the community of the senior centers as well as everyone else in the business and individual communities here. So we are so glad to continue to help out with everyone. Okay, uh, Angela, we can't thank Coons Toyota enough. Not only do you support uh, the mission with the citizen services and the senior centers, uh, but you've all also stepped up in a number of ways to many of the nonprofits in Carroll County. So you're a, you're a, you're a tremendous partner uh, we are glad to have you here in our county, and uh, we can't thank you and the Coons family enough uh, for showing the support that you do for the various uh, organizations that, that you, uh, you, are, you are involved with. So on behalf of all of us here, we want to thank you very, very much. Uh, we, we, we appreciate your efforts, and uh, we wish you the best as you continue to provide uh, a great resource for uh, for automobiles here right in downtown uh, Westminster. Any of my colleagues uh, want to chime in here? We'll open it up. I'd like to state I that. I just want to say uh, thank, you for, uh, uh, thank you for the uh, supporting the senior centers. Uh, they do a, a great service to hundreds and uh, if not thousands of uh, our seniors in Carroll County and uh, your support is not uh, doesn't go unnoticed. Well, thank you very much, and I will make sure that I um, share this information with Mr. Coons himself, as well as our general manager here. Uh, we're just fortunate that we are a business that is able to serve the community, so from the youngest to the oldest, and I mean from 4-H to Carroll County Senior Centers, the Boys and Girls Club, Carroll County Youth Service Bureau. There's just so many good efforts in the county, so. Mr. Thanks Huchet. for paying attention to the seniors and helping them out. They've taken a hit throughout this whole pandemic with the senior centers being closed. So we're all sincerely grateful. Also, your business represents so many other businesses throughout this county that are very generous in helping. We have a very great 
private sector in partnership with our uh, public sector. So thank you very much for all you do. Okay, I appreciate it. Commissioner Frazier, Coons Toyota is in your district, so we can't it go is. without hearing from you. Uh, thank you very much for the $10,000 donation, especially for the senior centers. It really does go a long way, and what you heard of what the money has paid for in the past is really good. And I'm really surprised you got off without Commissioner Boucher asking for a tour, but that might be coming up later. <laughs> <laughs> Our doors are open with a mask on, obviously. <laughs> Usually when you take a tour of Coons Toyota, there's cash involved. There's, you, know, you might want to have that, a little bit of cash uh, standing by. Because the last time I was in there, I didn't leave without taking something off the parking lot. So there's that. Uh, you know. All right. <clears throat> Look, um, we, we truly do appreciate it. Thank you. And, and please give our best to uh, Crystal Coons and the Coons family. And uh, thank you very much uh, for all the support that you give to all of us here in Carroll County. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great time. Okay, with that, we're going to uh, roll into our uh, Priority Carol, and I'm going to start with Commissioner Frazier. <laughs> All right, because thank he's you. like right here. That's why. No Make, rhyme or reason except you're like right here. Makes sense. <laughs> makes perfect sense to me. Uh, I, thank you. I want to start with the senior opioid policy a group that meeting was yesterday. Um, really, what I want to bring everyone up to uh, speed on is that that group and the Behavioral Behavioral Health Advisory Council want to join together to make one group. Most of the people in one group are, in, are on the other one already, and so they basically talk about similar things anyway. And if they join together, and it's going to be brought before us pretty soon to ask our opinion or our, I guess, uh, condolences, or not condolences, that to make sure that we agree with it. There you go. <laughs> um, there, you know, but most most of the people are, are, are one or the other. All the people will be included in this particular group. It just would streamline it, make it a little bit easier uh, for them to, to to work through what they're doing. So that's going to be brought before us from the uh, someone from the senior opioid policy group will come up with that. Um, if you watched the board of ed meeting last night, the schools are going to stay in hybrid until at least January seventh. They're going to reevaluate that week of January seventh to see what will happen from that point on. And they plan on starting sports, uh, winter sports, on December 14th. And that's all I'll say about that. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Commissioner Boucher, good morning. Good morning, gentlemen. I'm looking forward to this vaccine coming out so I can come into the office and give Commissioner Wayne a big hug and kiss on the cheek without a mask. Okay. Okay. So that's not going to happen. <laughs> With or without a vaccine. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, I want to start out by mentioning the uh, uh, artists take spotlight. This weekend is the art tour with artists across the county from Tawny Town to Woodbine. And I had mentioned this before about getting unique gifts for people since this is a very good So please take the time to do the tour of the artists and support them. And also stop in at different. Uh, restaurants on Main Street and patronize those small establishments there as well. <clears throat> also want to mention that firearms deer season started this past Saturday. I don't have the harvest numbers yet because they weren't going, but last year it was a total of over 5,500 deer harvested in Carroll County alone. And what's critically important about this is it helps our farmers uh, prevent the crop damage and also, a lot of hunters, and especially the farmers who have crop damage permits, donate a large portion of their deer harvested to Feed the Hungry. And this year, more than ever, this Feed the Hungry program is very critical. So please be supportive of this. If you are a hunter and you're harvesting more deer than you can actually consume, please talk to your local deer process provider, and they can hook you up and make the donation of Feeding the Hungry. And you might also want to check with your accountant because there, some of that cost of butchering might be tax deductible. So you can actually help the poor with feeding the hungry and get a tax deduction. With that, I'll wrap it up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Commissioner Weaver, good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Commissioner Boucher, thank you for that uh, uh, little uh, segment about the deer and I know one uh, 
processing plant has something like 550 deer already in there that feed uh, the homeless that have been donated uh, from hunters. So uh, there is uh, a lot going on out there. And, you know, I appreciate the, uh, uh, you know, the people that look at these things almost like rats sometimes uh, running through the fields, uh, doing a lot of devastation. They cost millions of dollars, billions of dollars nationally uh, in crop damage. So uh, uh, hunting season is a control measure to keep, them under, uh, keep the deer population down. I do want to remind people, the Farm Museum has all kind of uh, a, uh, events here for the season. I won't give you the times because I may mess them up, but you may want to get on the website and look. Um, nice family, outdoor family events that you can attend uh, at the Farm Museum coming up. Uh, by the way, I've been out somewhat in the community here and the wearing of masks is uh, stepped up. I've noticed everybody lately, uh, they get out of a vehicle, put the mask on. Uh, it, it has been an increased resurgence in the wearing of masks and worrying about the uh, uh, COVID uh, outbreak. So I do want to uh, say thank you to the people out here, my friends and neighbors and what they're doing. I noticed uh, Thanksgiving, there was all kinds of changes in the events. Families, uh, it was different, but very successful in the way they handled it. And I want to just commend people out here for doing what they have to do until we get this under control. And with that, uh, you keep in mind, we have a lot of small businesses out here, but you don't actually necessarily have to shop there. Buy a gift card as a holiday gift. Go into you know the shop, get a gift card from these small businesses. That's a way to keep them afloat, a way to support them, and you don't have to actually go out and do the shopping. And uh, I'm a great believer in gift cards here, but uh, especially if we support our local businesses with them, uh, people can go in later as we get vaccines into here and really keep supporting those type of businesses. Thank you. Commissioner Rothstein, good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah, I guess segueing uh, from some of the other comments, definitely uh, let's continue to uh, focus on shopping local and eating local. Uh, gift cards are a great opportunity. Uh, I also saw the articles about the arts and crafts across Carroll County, another great opportunity. Um, you know, the I, I would be remiss if I if I don't go into talking about the masks and what we need to do. There's 3,000 plus deaths that happened across the United States. We are not out of control. We are in a very dangerous situation. And the expectation is that there will be a continued rise in deaths before the vaccines become vaccinations for the general public. I, I look forward to the vaccines working and uh, serving our communities but we have a long, long ways to go. And, um, you know, my, my feeling is, and, and you've heard me say this before, if it's a priority, then we need to resource the priority. Time, people, and money. And that goes with the, us as leaders. It goes with the businesses. Uh, and it also goes with the community working together, uh, leading by example. It's one of those lead, follow, or get the hell out of the way uh, type of attitude. And I believe that we as uh, the Board of Commissioners must continue to lead in doing what's right, and others will follow. Um, working together with the businesses and the community, we will get through this. Uh, it's, we got a long ways to go. Um, I, I applaud all the work that's being done, but I believe we still have a long ways to go. I, I apologize if this is preaching, but I, I'm, I'm getting too close to too many folks that are getting sick, and uh, I don't like it. So I got to figure out how can we do better because what's working right now or what we're doing right now is not working. We got to continue to, uh, to uh, ramp it up. So I ask those that can wear masks, keep social distancing, continue to uh, wash your hands. It does work. And I'll tell you, if this gets out to one person in our community, I'm happy. If it gets out to two, I'm ecstatic. So let's just continue to push it. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Commissioner Rothstein. 
Uh, just a couple quick things for me. Uh, you all have already mentioned uh, about our restaurants and our small business community. I, I don't know if anyone's noticed lately, but the weather's changing. So it is very important to remember to, uh, to continue to, to support our, our restaurants. All of them are doing carry out. If you're not comfortable inside, at least go get carry outs from these folks and uh, <clears throat> utilize best practices. Uh, that, that's as, as Commissioner Rothstein says, that's the most important thing right now. Uh, on that theme, I had uh, the opportunity to participate in the Federal Emergency Management Agency Region 3 uh, meeting yesterday. And uh, for those folks that are doubting uh, what's going on uh, up and down the East Coast, and this is a group uh, of, of representatives up and down the East Coast, uh, Region 3. Uh, for those that doubt the, the, uh, the efforts of our emergency management uh, folks uh, and everyone else, uh, I wish you could have been on that call. Uh, it is unbelievable the amount of work that's going on. Uh, I had the opportunity to talk to the fire chief of Pittsburgh uh, on the call yesterday, which was interesting because uh, we each had a different prediction on what would happen in the Wednesday afternoon football <laughs> game, which, by the way, is the first Wednesday afternoon NFL football game since like 19... To, I don't know, some, something. Um, anyway, um, it, the, that group of folks on there and, and, and the work that's going on to ensure that everybody stays safe is, is quite frankly amazing. And uh, I'm very proud to be the elected for Region 3 in the Federal Emergency Management Agency, uh, the elected representative. And it was just uh, remarkable to hear the work that's being done. So uh, kudos to everybody as they continue the efforts here to get us out of this pandemic. I also was involved in the Good Scout uh, presentation that occurred uh, yesterday. And as a matter of fact, uh, that presentation is about a 10 minute video uh, that was done. And if you wanna see that, uh, you can get on to, uh, well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll touch base with, uh, with Chris Swam because I'm looking at him. And we'll put it on our website today uh, because it's about a 10 minute video. And instead of choosing a good scout representative as they typically do, uh, it's all about the benefits of scouting and the things that are occurring uh, when it comes to uh, the scouts and the efforts that they make here in Carroll. So we'll, we'll get that and I'll have uh, Chris get that on our website. And then you all can uh, take advantage of seeing what was a very fine program. Uh, we all had the opportunity to have an updated meeting this earlier this week with Carroll Community College, and they, like everyone else, are, are facing a lot of challenges. Uh, but I got to say, after that meeting, I was very optimistic about their, um, their efforts out there. They're doing a great job. Um, correct me, what were they ranked, Dennis? I can't, was it fourth in the Number one in the state of Maryland. One in the state. I think 24th in the country. That's it, yeah. So, yeah, ranked number one community college in the state and 24th in the country is remarkable. Uh, so, uh, there. listen, I guess it just goes to show that everybody's stepping up and doing an amazing job here as we get through uh, all the challenges of the pandemic. And uh, typically, this is the week of the, the Carroll Community College Foundation's biggest fundraiser, and that's Starry Night. Uh, that would be this coming Friday night. Uh, my wife and I have participated in that, and our sponsors of that have done that for quite some time. We're really going to miss it, but they're doing it virtually. So uh, that'll be interesting uh, on Friday night uh, as we see how they uh, pull that off. And to everything else, we're getting really savvy with virtual. So I'm sure they'll. Uh, I'm sure it'll be a great event. So kudos to them. Uh, I think that's all that I've got this morning. Anything else for Priority Carol? If not, we will roll right into hearing uh, from Ed Singer uh, of the Health Department and get the uh, latest information on statistics, vaccines, et cetera, et cetera. So Ed, good morning. Good morning, commissioners, and, and thank you again for uh, your continued support. And I think this is a, a, a good opportunity for, for us as a health department to reach uh, some of the general public. 
I often feel like I'm getting on here being the uh, the Grim Reaper and never have anything but uh, bad news to bring to you all. But today, there's the few things that you've already referenced, Commissioner, and I, I have a couple of other things to throw in there before we get into our data that I think are, are important and, um, and, 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 and good news in, uh, in, in some of this. Um, one is I want to start with, uh, you had mentioned the vaccine, and um, I think it's great that, you know, we're going to be seeing the, the rollout of the vaccine start in the next week or two, as, as you mentioned. However, people need to keep in mind, you know, this is going to be very limited, much like it was when we first started testing, it was it was really hard to get a test because there were, were very limited number of tests and laboratories that were conducting the uh, the testing and whatnot. It's going to be very similar to this when the vaccine first comes out. There, there are prioritizations that are given for the uh, primarily with the uh, frontline healthcare workers and and the very vulnerable populations in the uh, in nursing facilities and what whatnot that are going to be the first uh, priority to get it. And as Governor Hogan referenced on his uh, press conference last week, uh, I think the state's getting 150,000 doses, and that's not even enough to cover the, uh, the frontline healthcare workers. So while the vaccine's coming out, and that's really good news, I, you know, I want to temper that with people understanding that, you know, it's probably not going to be available to the general public for for several more months. But several more months is closer than there, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and uh, getting this up and and uh, getting started and in, we'll see this kind of grow just like we did with the testing capacity. The ability to get people vaccinated will grow as, as, as the vaccine rolls out. And, and as more companies uh, get approval for the use of their vaccine, there'll be, there'll be more availability. So very much looking forward to this. And, uh, you know, hopefully by next, by this time next year, we, we won't even be having to have discussions about COVID-19 and it can be an afterthought for us. So we've got a ways to go in this, but the, uh, the vaccine on the horizon is great news. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is uh, CDC. There, there's been a lot of uh, talk in the media about quarantine and, and uh, changes in, in quarantine. And, and there's a, uh, a possible shortened quarantine guidance that's coming up. Um, the, the guidance, it's not that uh, we, we were wrong on, on what's being, uh, what, what was out there with quarantine before. But everything that we've done in this pandemic, and I've talked to you before and talked to the school board about things being a relative risk. And the, uh, as we learn more about the disease and, and we learn about relative risk, we, we kind of adjust some of what we're doing. So a um, couple of key things is one is uh, the local public health authorities are still the ones that make the final decision on how long quarantine should last. And we're going to be working with the state on a consistent uh for something that's consistent statewide as to how we're going to manage these quarantines going forward. So it's not changing today. It's going to take a little while. It may be, you know, maybe by the end of the week, we'll have this in place, but uh, people need to be patient with us on that. But we know we've known all along and we've, we've, we've advised people that if they've been exposed, if they're going to get tested to get tested around day four or five, because that's when people are most likely to, to start shedding the disease and, and most likely to become sick. So, so we still know that around day or four or five is, is where, where the biggest risk is. Um, the guidance gives us some flexibility. Um, I think it's important, and, and the reason it's important for the, uh, for, for the public is this gives some flexibility to let some people get back to work or get back to some other things in their lives. But the, the important piece is, is people still need to keep an eye out for symptoms because it's not that you can't get sick between day 11 and day 14 it's just that the risk of becoming ill during that that end that, that those last few days of quarantine is low enough that um, CDC is advising that it's worth the risk of allowing people to, to come out of quarantine. So what, what we're looking at is uh, people may be able to come out of quarantine after 10 days with, without testing and possibly as early as the seventh day with, with a negative test. But the negative test has to happen on day five or later of the quarantine. So Really, I, I still think we're looking at probably a 10-day quarantine, even if we're trying to do the testing thing, because by the time you get a test scheduled and the time that the test result comes back, if, if you do it after day five, you're, you're probably looking at, at day nine or so anyway. So um, we're, we're probably looking at, in general, people being able to come out of quarantine after 10 days, which reduces the uh, amount of time that people can't work or, or out of uh, the community by, by about four days. Um, I did mention that this is a matter of relative risk, and the CDC is estimating that uh, 
if we if we go with this new um, with this new recommendation that the uh, what they call the residual post quarantine transmission risk is estimated to be somewhere between five and twelve percent. So that is an increase in risk, and we really need people to be honest with us. And if you're if you're if you're starting to feel like you have a sore throat or you're starting to develop a cost cough when you're in day ten. You need to uh, stay in quarantine and, and potentially get tested and, and make sure that you're not going out into public when you're sick because you can develop those symptoms between the, uh, the 11th and 14th day. It's important that if, if, we, uh, if we go forward with this new strategy that people um, in those last days that they would normally have been in quarantine continue to monitor their symptoms and to make sure that they're doing the right thing that we need to take care of each other. So. You know, this is uh, it's going to be a lot more for us to manage as a health department, but it does help the community some from from the standpoint of getting people back to work. Um, but again, we're, we're relying on the community to do the right thing and and make sure you don't go to work if you're sick. So um, that's I think what I've got to say about that uh, the changes in the quarantine. And then the third thing that I wanted to mention is our, our testing site was a bit overwhelmed right before Thanksgiving. And I think a lot of people were getting tested just because they were planning to travel and they wanted to know, you know, if they were, if they had COVID or not at that point in time, we, we've, uh, we've ramped it up. We did 225 tests at the site on Tuesday uh, with, with not much problem. And we're, we're able to get people in, 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 a, in a timely manner again um, as of this week. Like I said, last week we were overwhelmed and people were having to wait several days to get in. Generally speaking, people can get in on the ne next testing day with the capacity that we have at our testing site right now. So, so that that's kind of uh, good news as well. That said, we'll go ahead and uh, get into some of the statistical data. So, our cases last week were were, were down a bit, uh, down to 246. But I really think that that was a. Um, I'm looking for my notes here. Uh, um, I really think it was a matter of uh, the fact that testing uh, capability wasn't available for some of the days during the during the holidays. Not only our testing site was closed on Thursday, but a lot of the uh, commercial testing sites and doctor's offices weren't available. So I, I don't know, and, and I can't say that we're not at the peak of this 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 most recent surge that we've had, but I don't know that we are, and and, and I really don't think that we are. We had 71 cases on Tuesday, which was an all-time high this week. Uh, but but yesterday was low, so we were around 30 cases yesterday. So I, I don't know where we're going to wind up this week. We're about 150 right now um, in the middle of the week. Um, I, I don't know that we've hit the peak, though, because uh, there, there, there's some, some other factors that came into this because of the reduced availability of testing, and we have seen some very high days. So um, moving on, just the, uh, the probable cases, they seem to uh, – be mirroring the trend that we're seeing in the in the confirmed PCR cases. This is our 14-day rolling average. Fatalities. So we had uh, seven deaths last week, uh, two community and five in, in the uh, in, in the in the uh, facilities. And one of the things I didn't mention when I was on the case rate, we haven't seen a lot of facility cases. Uh, over the last several months, and last week we, we had uh, one of the highest rates we've had since back in, uh, I guess, May or June time frame where we had 17 facility-related cases. Um, so we did have seven deaths last week. Two of those were community-related, and, and five of those were facility-related. Um, the week before, we, we, we had four deaths that week as well. So far this week, we've had two community-related deaths and one facility-related death. So so those deaths are, are, are definitely climbing as we're seeing the uh, – the case rates climb as well. I see bed, I, I see U bed uh, usage has been pretty uh, pretty stable the last week. However, the, the hospital's still seeing a high number of uh, PUIs and COVID patients that they're that they're having to treat in the hospital. I want to, um, I guess, I'm going to step back to this uh, previous slide because I want to talk a little bit about the fatality rate because. Uh, a lot of people are talking about this disease not being so deadly and things of that that nature. And I, I saw what one of our uh, delegates put in the papers an editorial last uh, last weekend, and I just kind of wanted to talk about that a little bit because people talk about the fatality rate of this being relatively low at two percent. If two percent of everybody who gets infected with any disease uh, die from it, that's a pretty high fatality rate. 
Um, you know, the fatality rate seems to be waning a bit, and I think that's a lot because uh, we're seeing an improvement in, in treatment, and probably also because we're seeing a lot of the uh, a lot more younger and healthier people who are who are getting ill with COVID that that that's, that may be driving that rate down some. But to put this in perspective, um, since December of 2019. COVID-19 has killed more people in the United States than influenza has in the last five years. And we always have a big flu campaign, and we're trying to keep our, our uh, older population protected from the flu because we know the flu can be deadly. But a lot of people like to compare this to the flu. And, and you know, if you look at the annual flu numbers, if, if, we're, if we're killing five times as many people with this over the period of, uh, uh, I mean, that's, that's essentially what we're looking at, that we've had five times as many people die from from this than, than we had from uh flu over the last five years that's that's uh that's saying that's saying something well not i don't i misstated that it's it's essentially a five times the the fatality rate that we would see from flu because in the last five years uh if you if you take the deaths from flu in the last five years we've had more people die from that in this one year from from covid so it, it is serious and it's something that we we need to be taking serious and we're learn we're also worried about those long-term health effects that people will be suffering with that have potentially contracted this virus. Um, there's been a, a record number of deaths in the U.S. Um, yesterday, around 3,000 deaths reported, and a record number of hospitalizations, over 100,000 across the U.S. And, and uh, you know, that increase in hospitalizations is usually followed by an increase in, in the deaths that are reported. So, you know, uh, I had good news to report in the, on the front end, this, that we're in a bad part of this uh, pandemic right now, and I don't think any of the models that I saw had, had predicted us seeing an increase in cases, an increase in deaths and all uh, that, that would rival the beginning of the pandemic. But we, we knew we were going to see a second spike. We just, I don't think any of us expected it to be quite this big. Uh, moving on to our, our community uh, cases by, by week and age. The, uh, as I said, the cases were down last week, so the, the cases dropped in all the age groups last week except for the age under 18. We're still seeing a lot of uh, younger people uh, getting the virus. And if you, if you look at this chart here, I think that it illustrates it very well. You can see all the age groups were on a downward trend last week, uh, and I think, again, that's because of our limited capacity to test during the holiday week. But uh, the one age group where, where the number of cases went up was that age group that was less than 18. And this is just our hospitalizations by uh, and, and deaths by age group. And the important thing is, and, and I uh, appreciate the commissioner saying this over and over again, wear your mask, keep your distance, avoid large crowds, keep connected with family and whatnot. We, we need to use technology, especially with our older population and, and whatnot to keep people connected. And, and even with our, our, uh, our, our kids that are, that are uh, school age and whatnot that aren't seeing their classmates in school, uh, trying to keep them connected by Zoom or, or, or some type of video chat or whatnot is a good thing just to help people uh, keep engaged. And, and you know, I, I was on the state's Alzheimer's commission at one point in time one of the most important things we could do to, uh, I think, uh, help people prevent Alzheimer's is to keep uh, the senior population engaged. So it's really important that we keep our senior population socially engaged, whether it's, uh, you know, I love the thing that Celine was talking about this morning, how they're doing the uh, virtual exercise classes and things like that. But make sure you're checking in on your family members and, and let's do what we can to keep them healthy. And if you can do outside activities still, that's the thing to do. Um, the last thing I want to want to kind of remind people about is uh, we're trying to plan for vaccinations in the community, and as I said, it'll probably be several months before we see those roll out to the general public. But what we're trying to do is is figure out how comfortable people would be getting vaccinated, and, and uh, you know I, I've heard it all over the place. I I, I certainly don't think there's going to be any type of mandate for people to get vaccinated at this point in time. Um, but what we want to know is is whether or not people are comfortable being vaccinated and how likely they are to get vaccinated so we can better plan. So if you go to the Carroll County Health Department's website or, or this link that's right here on the slide that I'm showing you, um, you can take a survey just to let us know whether or not you'd be willing to be vaccinated and, and, and your whole thoughts on that process. And it'll help us plan for uh, 
for vaccinations as we get into the uh, the months when we're going to be trying to uh, vaccinate vaccinate a large number of people from the public. So that's uh, that's it. I'll be glad to entertain any questions that the commissioners would have at this point in time. And I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing so you can see me again. Hey Ed, uh, again appreciate all the um, information that you provided. <clears throat> My knowledge is limited on what I'm gonna share, and it's, it's my sister's a pediatrician. And what she's finding is that children that are testing positive, that it's a very, almost an alarming rate of the whole family is ending up being positive and they're not getting tested. And she's very animate in getting the families tested and then they find the whole family uh, could be testing positive. Are we seeing the same thing where we're finding families that are being like in groups uh, testing positive in Carroll County, or there's not enough information on that. So, so I can tell you from what we're seeing with our contact tracing, um, we're finding, and, and I'm seeing, it, it, well, and just anecdotally looking at, at the test results that come in from the Ag Center, I'm seeing, I'm seeing whole groups of families where it's five, six, seven people that got tested at the same time are, are all positive. Now, I can say that I, I have known some people who. Um, if somebody in the family gets sick, it's not an easy thing to keep everybody from everybody else from getting sick. And, and in most cases, we're seeing the entire family get sick. There, there is. I have seen people. I've known people personally who who one of one of the families gotten infected. And if you so so the strategy is, and, and this is what we talk people through when we talk to them in contact tracing is, if you have one person in your family sick and the rest of the people test negative, you try to keep that person isolate it within the house or, or even if they can go somewhere else and stay until, until their, their isolation periods up, that's, that would be the best thing. But if, if you don't have any place else to go, the, uh, the best thing to do is to have them have a separate bedroom with a separate bathroom and keep them separate from the rest of the family. And, you know, I've had people who, who've had their kids be sick where the adults weren't sick. And what they essentially do is they got, they, they've got to keep the young person in, in the room by themselves. And this is even harder. Um, but, you know, you make them a meal, you drop it off in front of the door. They, they essentially kind of clean and sanitize their own dishes to a little bit. They leave it outside the door and then you bring them their next meal. So it's, it's, you really can't have contact with the rest of the family if you're sick, because if you, if you have that close contact, it's, there's a very high likelihood that everybody in the house is going to get sick. So right. it can be prevented from spreading through the whole house. It's not easy. And, and in most cases we're seeing if, if, Family members are continuing to live with somebody who's sick. Most of them are eventually getting COVID. We, we've seen cases too where, you know, family member A gets it on week one and then two weeks later, another family member has it. And then another week later, the rest of the family gets it. So it's, it's not, it's not an easy disease to prevent from spreading. So but, hopefully but this, that answers what you were looking no, it, for. It, it is. And, but, but the fact is this is not chicken pox either. This is not herd, you know, mentality bring all the kids together and let them all get sick and then they'll be immune to it afterwards. Um, this is, you know, cause, cause I've heard that as well, that people are saying, well, if they're young, they're not going to get sick, you know, they're going to get the virus and they'll be healthy and everything's good. So let's get them all sick first and then they're not going to get it again. Um, so that, that's also it, just one of those concerns. I think that's a good point commissioner. And it's, there's a lot lower risk to the younger population, but as, as Governor Hogan talked about last week, they had a one-year-old that died from this last last, uh, last week. Um, the, the risk to the, the younger population, I don't want to overblow it, is not high, but, but people can die from this, and they can have long-lasting uh, effects on scarring on, on the lungs that could, could cause them long-term uh, issues. I, you know, I don't know how, how well they're going to recover from that scarring over a period of time, and and nobody knows because we, we're not going to see that right now. But it's not, you know, with chicken pox, we knew that generally you were going to you're going to be itchy and it was going to be uncomfortable and you'd get over it. And, and that was going to kind of be the end of it, that this disease can have long lasting effects and could potentially be deadly. So we don't want to be unnecessarily exposing people to it. We want to get to the point where we have the vaccine and we can get people vaccinated and and keep the community at, at large healthy, healthy because of that. And that, that'll be our herd immunity once we get everybody vaccinated. Mr. Singer, thanks for your weekly report. Our citizens very much look forward to this. 
I, I've always been concerned about our senior citizens. I think the most recent stat shows that 87% of our fatalities are above 65. And now we're seeing fatalities hitting our senior population again. What is causing, can you state that through contract, contact tracing, has it been determined what is reinfecting our senior facilities? Has that been determined? Well, if you want to talk about how, how seniors are getting this, so so the ones in the facilities, you know, you know there's nothing you can do about it because, um, well, well, other than to try to monitor symptoms and make sure that your staff aren't sick, and we're doing we, we're we're testing staff twice a week in, in the uh, in the facilities right now, so we're doing everything that we can. But the problem is, is you know, the staff don't live there. It, it's it's not that the um, that the that the people who are living in our nursing homes are are, are getting sick. From, from each other so much as some staff member who, who happens to be out in the community gets the disease somewhere. And it's not that necessarily anybody's done every, anything wrong. I've talked to so many people that have been doing all the right things and, and, and they just have, have an encounter with somebody. And, you know, we, we do things to reduce risk, but there's no way that you can have zero risk. There's, there's always, as long as staff are going in and out of the facility, there's always a risk that somebody's going to bring the disease with them when they, when they come to work. And, and there's, you know, there's nothing we can do to make anything 100% safe. We're doing a lot of things to try to mitigate the disease, but uh, that's that's uh, you know that's primarily where people in the facility are catching it from are, are from from staff. Now, um, you know, the older population out in the community that that are getting sick and dying from this, they're they're getting it from family gatherings, and that's why I've sort of highly encouraged people to try to, you know, in, unless you you know that you've that you've been really safe. Uh, you know the the interaction with our with our older loved ones needs to be somewhat limited, and and you know we, we've got to do things differently than we've done them before. I've been encouraged encouraging people to engage with uh, with their older relatives in, in a virtual manner as much as we can. Uh, we do need to keep them engaged because you, you know the the whole having them disconnected is is probably almost as bad as this whole COVID thing that we're dealing with. But uh, we also need to be safe about. If, if we know we, we've been doing relatively higher risk activities, to have physical contact and whatnot is not the thing to be doing right now. So we, we need to do what we can to, to keep our distance and keep safe, especially when we're around that vulnerable population. Thank you, Mr. Singer. Hey, Ed, I have a question for you. Because I've seen this on social media and I would like the truth to get out there. And you're the man who's going to tell us the truth. <laughs> when you're looking for a place to get tested. Let's say you don't get tested in Carroll County, but you live in Carroll County, you go to Baltimore or Anne Arundel or somewhere else and you get tested and it's a positive test. Where does that, that uh, positive test go to? As it say, it's, it's, if you got tested in Anne Arundel County, comes up on their stats or because you live in Carroll County, comes up on our stats. So it, it's all based on the statistics is all based on your, your, uh, your, your residents. So if you right. live in Carroll County, it doesn't matter where you're tested. Uh, those will be reported to the Carroll. It's a reportable disease. It all gets reported to the Carroll County Health Department. Now, you know, if you have a medical provider order your test, they're going to get the report as well. But uh, uh, statistically speaking, the the uh, the data is reported based on where you live. Right. I mean, I, I appreciate you saying that because there's a lot of back and forth in social media about, you no, know, if you go to Anne Arundel County, it goes to them. And I'm saying, no, that's not true. It goes by where you live, but I'm, I'm glad that you, you know, you backed me up on that and you said that so everyone can hear it. It's where you live, no matter where you get tested. That's where the stats go. And, you know, we're, we're testing some people from out of county at, at our at our facility as well over at the uh, at the Ag Center. And those those cases get re we, they don't get reported out as as Carroll County cases. They get reported out in the county where the person lives. <clears throat> Anything else for Ed? Uh, I, hate to, I, I hate to get on a rant, but you brought it up, Dennis. You know, the social media oh. thing. And Ed, you mentioned that there was an editorial in the paper last week. I, I, and and uh, Ed, you brought it up, Ross, uh, Commissioner Rothstein, about leaders leading. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, I don't get the divisiveness that continues to occur. And then that just fuels that dumpster of our society, social media. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, how great would it be if we actually utilize social media to stay connected to families instead of trying to bash one another 
based on what somebody puts that's absurd in an editorial somewhere. Uh, that that it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't understand when we get stronger as we keep moving together to get to the, the end of this, why there are still that faction of people that want to divide us all. It's, it, it, it boggles my mind. And I'll just stop there. Any other questions for, for, um, for Ed? That really wasn't a question. That was a, <clears throat> that was a, a, a mini sermon. Sorry. It just, that, that, that just, it really it's bothers a question. me. I agree with you. <laughs> I, I just, it really bothers me. We all need to be moving together to get to the bottom and the end of this. And this consistent divisiveness that we see is just ridiculous. Um, so anyway, um, Ed, we appreciate again, the, the, uh, the efforts that, that all of you are, are doing over there. And I know, uh, you touched on it a little bit, uh, but as the vaccines begin to ramp up, there is a plan here in the County, uh, to, to make sure that, that those that need it first and it, get it and so forth. So I want to make sure the public, I know you touched on it, but just reiterate that. You don't have to go through the plan, Ed, but just reiterate the fact that you've been meeting with all the partners and there is a plan in place for that. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, your county staff, your emergency uh, management folks, law enforcement, um, the school system, it, it, you know, we, we've gotten great support out of everybody. You know, I can't plug the Ag Center enough for, for what they've been doing for us in our, in our testing efforts. And, you know, maybe as we, we vaccinate people, that might be a place that we look at doing that. Um, gets complicated because uh, unlike most uh, most times when we do mass vaccinations, we, we kind of do a, some mass clinics and it's done. This is going to be an ongoing effort. And, and uh, so we're going to have to be creative, but there's a lot of uh, cooperative um, discussion going on. And, and uh, you know, there, there's still a lot of unknowns, but everybody, everybody's uh, involved. And I know when, when, when the vaccine actually shows up, it's going to be all hands on deck amongst all of our agencies and all of our community partners to get it out there and make sure that we can get uh, people in the community vaccinated and, and, and get ourselves back to as close to normal as we can, as soon as we can. All right. Anything else for Ed? Thank you, sir. All right. That uh, takes us into the next step and that's our uh, uh, COVID relief fund plan. And for that report, and actually we're getting ever so closer to the end there on that as much of these uh, funds that we're getting have to be spent by the end of, of this calendar year. So, uh, but let's get the update. And for that, I'll turn it over to our County Administrator, Roberta Windham. Good morning, thank you. <clears throat> yes, uh, you're right, absolutely correct. We're getting there at the end, the, um, the 14.7 million that we received back in the late spring, early summer all has to be um, spent and distributed by um, December 30th. Um, the restaurant relief, uh, which is the 1.2 uh, million, a little more than 1.2 million that we received from the state just a, a few weeks ago, a month ago, <clears throat> has to be out of our hands by December 31st, but does not have to be spent by the recipients until the um, uh, first few months in, in, in uh, the new year. So nothing particular to update uh, the board with at this time, other than we're continuing to work the plan. Um, as I mentioned last week, and I think the week before, we will be uh, coming to you, still our goal on the 10th of December to go over the, the plan, where we stand and um, what the final pieces are and, and um, how they'll all work in. So unless there are any questions about um, that, I'll turn it over to Jack to talk about the two economic development programs going on at the moment, the retail one, which is um, part of the CRF, part, part of the federal money um, for $500,000 um, most recently, and also the state restaurant relief of 1.2 million. So, and where we stand on um, distributing those funds. So, Jack? Uh, good morning. The uh, last Tuesday, if you remember, we opened up the, the retail to services. It was Tuesday and we closed it down at uh, Wednesday at uh, around four o'clock. Uh, we, we spent the whole $500,000 and uh, 
and uh, we awarded to 142 applicants. Uh, we're getting the app the applications in, and the funds be they're going out, you know, weekly here. So that program was a big success. 142 uh, applicants. However, on the on the restaurant side, we we're having a real <laughs> real uh, tea pulling on this one. To date, we awarded 117 to a total of $809,000. We have a balance of uh, 392,000. We, uh, the, there was 11, we call them uh, service kitchens. So far we've had four that applied. Uh, we're holding our hands and, and getting the, the ones, the VFWs and the um, people like that to apply. Right now we have uh, 28 applicants that could be funded. We're calling them. We're going out and visiting them, you know. Um, but if they're if we fund all 28, it's 196 thousand dollars. We're going to have left over uh, 100, another 196 thousand. It's roughly half. So we're we're close to you know almost 400 thousand dollars. And my recommendation is that there's two recommendations. Uh, that we we take this as of next week sometime, you know, say next Wednesday, we keep working with all these uh, these uh, other restaurants, 28, and then cut it off, either go back and take the whatever money we have left, to, you know, part of the, um, the $400,000, and go back and give it to the... Uh, you know, the 125 or so restaurants, split it up and give it to them. Or if we open up to the franchises here, but it would be, it couldn't be a corporate franchise. Excuse me, it would have to be local, <coughs> excuse me, local uh, franchise. So I guess that's my two scenarios where our, like I said, our best case scenario would, would um, we would distribute another, almost 200,000, but we're going to have a good $200,000, you know, left over out of that, um, you know, 1.2 million. So we could do, but it would, it would be individually locally owned franchise and the owners would have to, um, you know, be living here in Carroll County and operating in Carroll County, but we wouldn't do the corporate franchise if we go that route. Or like I said, we just take the, whatever money's left over right now, it's 400,000, but we, and we just distributed to the other, you know, 125 or so restaurants that we've, we've already given it to. So I guess I need some direction. Um, we're getting close to the end, you know, I didn't realize there was two more weeks left in the, but we, we like to cut this off and, you know, change directions a little bit, you know, next week, early next week. Hey, Jack. Um, I guess I'm not the biggest fan of uh, giving it out to the franchises because uh, I do believe that corporate helps the franchises themselves um, and probably has programs in place. So that may be a little difficult. Um, the question though is the amount of money that we're giving to the restaurants now, um, how, how much is it uh, to the restaurants, like per restaurant? Uh, at first, right now we're averaging um, a little over 700, I mean 7,000. If they have nine or fewer employees, they get 5,000. If they have more than 10 employees, they get 10,000. Okay. Um, just curious, and, and you may not know, uh, surrounding jurisdictions, are they doing the same, five and 10,000? Uh, or is it up to us? It sounds like it's up to us on what we want to give as far as grants. So if, if, if we increased it, you know, to six and 11 or, you know, seven and 12, then it's going to spend all the money, um, up front. I mean, do you know what the other jurisdictions are doing? Uh, I do not. Okay. And, and that, that's fair, but I mean, that, that may suffice. I, okay. I, I'm just curious. Cause, uh, I know we're, we're, we're very quick out of the gate in doing things and you're incredibly aggressive, which I appreciate um, and responsive to the businesses. I just don't know what the, what the numbers are compared to the other jurisdictions. Um, I think I that's think. where I'm leaning towards is because they're, they're hurting. I mean, they're the, the feedback I'm getting is that these restaurants are just in a really bad situation. 
So uh, a couple more thousand dollars may be the way to, to go, but that just open up thoughts. Yeah, I think it, it, I think it varies across each jurisdiction, Ed, because what um, I had a, had a conversation with uh, the county executive in Baltimore County, and I also talked to the county executive in Howard County, and they've got they put different sums of money towards it too, based because some of the bigger counties got uh, more money than than we got from a different source. So uh, I don't think there's any rhyme or reason. Is it, it 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 varies based on jurisdiction, and my only concern, if you would up it now, would be that the ones that put in for it before were kept at five and 10. So would you, would you go back and give them additional? I see that, I, I get a little bit challenged there with that. I don't know. I'd like to do that, but we'd almost have to go back and give the, the extra then to those that put in for it before and were, were, were limited at five and 10, right? Yeah, that's what, I, that's what I was thinking, is that there's no way we would do it unless we did that. You know, I mean, that's only the only fair way of doing it. How hard would that be, Jack? Well, the way we would do it is we, we would cut it off, let's say, of these 2023, 20, we'd, we'd cut it off, let's say, next Tuesday. Um, and whatever we have left, we would go back. You know, we could have, oh, roughly, we could probably about 125. So we go back to the 125 restaurants and take, you know, whatever's left, you know, co you know, 350,000 and distribute it to them. Cause we, we've gotten, you know, we've got 90% of the applicants already in, you know, we were issuing checks there right now. So we'd have to go back and just take those, whatever we have awarded and take that and kind of split it and send it back out to all. And we could do that pretty easy. I think that's that would be an easy way of doing it. Um, we can we can make it we can make it all the same. You know, if we have three hundred thousand, you know, or whatever, you know, divided by you know one hundred twenty-five, you know, do it that way. Or yeah, um, I think you're on, I think you're onto something, Ed, with that and Jack. I think that's the fairest way to do it. I think and 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 Ed, you're right. I've heard from a couple. Uh, restaurant owners, myself, and as this weather changes, they're they're uh, they're 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 into some challenging times ahead. So it isn't doing us any good. Let's get it back out to them. A couple grand means a lot for some of these. I I agree with you. Uh, and as we get into uh, this season, uh, I know a lot of them are really starting to hurt and. Uh, we have the money, the short period of time to get it out. I think Jack's idea is great. Let him divide it out and get extra money to him as fast as he can. I agree. It's a good idea. But I want to real quickly go back and re review this, this local franchise idea just to understand it. How big of a pool of local franchises is it? And give us a couple of examples. Before we skip over, I just want to give some due review. What is a local franchise, so to speak? Uh, Subways, Subways would be a local owned franchise. Rita's Ice would be a local owned franchise. Um, you get, you gotta be, you know, you gotta be careful. You know, you have the McDonald's and the Chick-fil-A's, um, they're, they're locally owned franchise, um, companies like that. There's, uh, there's over, there's almost 200 franchise, uh, but they're not, uh, they're, a lot of them are corporate too. You gotta be kind of gotta be careful. Some some of them are corporate owned, and we do know who's corporate. We do know who's local on this. Um, but if you open it up, you got you got to be careful with the franchise because they got to be locally owned and they have to be operating here in Carroll County. Thanks. Have we heard any distress from these local franchises before we skim over them? I just want to make sure that we haven't heard from them and they're, they're not under any stress and need some help. We've, we've heard a couple of them. We haven't heard, you know, from the McDonald's or the Chick-fil-A's or some of, you know, or to, to, I, I guess the drive-throughs are doing fairly well, you know, when they're set up for drive-throughs. But we have, we have got a couple local, you know, we had a Subway, we had one Subway, and we had a Rita's Ice, I know, come in, and we denied them, of course, you know. But uh, 
no, we have not had a lot of applications. But you got to remember too, we put in our all our criteria is that we weren't going to fund. We, we weren't going to fund franchise. We've had it out there probably geez, what a half a dozen times in the paper, and everybody else that we weren't going to fund franchise. So to be fair with them, I'm sure if you open up the franchise, the money would go. You know, because we got quite a few. Could we possibly offer something to the local franchises that don't have drive-through? Just, just a thought because they're hurting as well. I don't. I. I listen, no, I think I, it's I, a, I think, Eric. I appreciate the uh, intent. One, I think it may be too complex um, because also <clears throat> franchises um, have corporate backing and support. In many cases, they'll either have loan programs or other programs that I'm not familiar with um, designed in, you know, challenging times. And, and I'm, you know, I, I know that some corporations have uh, provided uh, monies to franchise owners because, you know, they don't want them to fail because it's their name. Um, I think if we stick to the intent of how we wanted this grant to go towards our county restaurants and local businesses and eateries is I think the way to go. And I, the, the biggest thing for me in doing that also is ensuring we do not have $1 left on the table, you know, uh, out of that 1.2. But uh, yeah, I'm, I, I, I try to keep it as simple as we can at this point and get that money out. Well, I appreciate the discussion. I think it was important to at least cover it before we move on. So thank you. Well, if we close it down, let's say we're calling these 28 or we're going to visit them. Either one, uh, we're out there saying, please, you know, come after the money. Whatever's left, we could we could say, well, Tuesday at 12 o'clock, that's it. We're not taking any more applications on this. And then at that point, we could turn around whatever money we have left, you know, to do an analysis, take you know, um, a couple hours to do, we would turn around and we'd go back to the 125 and, um, you know, send them an email and said, Hey, we're going to give you this amount of money, you know, split it up and, and get and distribute the money next week. We could do that relatively easy and relatively, relatively fast, you know, whatever's left over. It, it say, move take forward. Hours for it to be done because you have a great team doing it. If it was you, it would probably take a few days, but that's a different story. That's true. The, t the team is, uh, it would probably take me a couple months, right? Yeah. <laughs> the next Christmas. The, the, yeah. team, the team is, uh, we have an incredible team down here doing it. We're ready for the next one. If we can help businesses, we're ready. Yeah. We're under a tremendous time restraint here, too, so keep it simple. Well, that would be simple. Okay. I don't I don't know what we've done in the past. Have we we taken a formal vote on this or just given direction? I think we've taken a formal vote, haven't we? So you wanna you wanna roll with that, Ed? Uh, okay. So I'll make the motion that we continue to uh, go after the grant monies for local businesses, local restaurants, and as uh, close of business on Tuesday. Um, uh, we'll do, do it Tuesday, like 12 o'clock, you know, okay. we'll tell them. Mid midnight, uh, the grant process will close for applications. The leftover mm -hmm. funds yeah. will be then divvied up to those that have uh, received the grants until all money is exhausted. Equ equally, Just everybody. Yeah. Equally. Okay, that's fair. Okay. You meant, you meant noon, 12 o'clock, right, Jack? Not mi Or midnight. Oh, uh, yes. Noon, 12 o'clock. Wait, are you saying noon? Yeah. P yeah. PM, Tuesday PM. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, noon. Yes, noon. noon. 12 o'clock noon. Okay, got it. Hi, noon. <laughs> I mean, I, actually, Ed, I'd like to see the whole Economic Development Department come in next Tuesday at 12.01 a.m. to start the <laughs> process, but, but I, I'm, I think noon's probably good. <laughs> I can tell you, we've been. some of us have been working at 12 a.m. to get these uh, <laughs> out, but it's well yeah. worth it. Yep. The businesses right, are up to 12, 1 o'clock, worrying about where, where the money's going to come from. We're there with them. We're, exactly. we're supporting them. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions on this? If not, all those in favor? 
and that's unanimous except for Weaver. Did we? There he is. You were <laughs> you, you were delayed, Weaver. I don't. It's your camera, not. It might be you. I don't know. All right, that's unanimous. Anything else, Jack? Okay, Roberta. Yeah, Jack. I don't believe so. I think that's it for us today. Okay, and then we'll look forward next week to the more extensive talk on where we are. As we always said, we were going to hit that tenth, and then we we got some. We'll have a better idea where we are with numbers. Okay, thanks. All right, anything else, COVID? All right, then we're gonna move through our agenda items this morning. And the first one is uh, the proposed agreement of the sale of the uh, North Carroll uh, High School. And for that, I think we're going to hear from Jack Lyburn again. And you're muted, Jack. Make sure you're unmuted because this one's kind of important. So we want to hear you on this one too. I'm there sorry. You go. I'm sorry. There you go. Okay. That's good. Um, in, in 2016, with the declining enrollment, uh, the Board of Education closed North Carroll um, High School. Uh, since then, uh, you've given us the task, this department of marketing uh, the high school um, for sale. We, we over the over the years, over the four years, you know, we've spent, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars maintaining the building, with the maintenance of the building, the gym, and the fields, and they they continue to be used um, by local recreation councils. Uh, you know, I have attended a couple meetings uh, with the citizens and, and attended meetings, many meetings with uh, the mayor. And, and the overall, I guess, vision was that it would stay as a school. And we, we threw out, I guess, early on that we use it as a sports complex. And we finally, we got up, we've been negotiating, I guess, about nine months now with a company called Chesapeake Real Estate Group, LLC, and they submitted a contract to purchase the building and the grounds. And, you know, we've, we've met with the, uh, you know, we met with, you know, with our, our permitting department. And what I'd like to do now before we go into to the, um, is Matt Laraway. Uh, Matt is uh, one of the senior partners in the Chesapeake Real Estate Group. He's also um, a resident of Hampstead. And, and uh, kind of what goes around comes around. Matt and I worked about 20 years ago as the brokers, um, the broker and the economic development here on the Sweetheart Cup deal. So Matt's very familiar with with uh, Hampstead and with this school. So I think Matt, you're on here. If you could uh, just come up with your vision at Chesapeake um, Real Estate Group's vision, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Jack. Uh, can Can you hear me? I think I've got unmuted. Yeah, we're good. Yes. We're good, Matt. Go ahead. Okay, great. Well, thank you guys for the time, and and Jack, thank you for working with us over the last you know six nine months on on this project. So, quick overview: Chesapeake Real Estate Group is a privately held real estate development company in the Greater Baltimore area. I'm a Hampstead resident. Just moved in there about four years ago into the Oakmont neighborhood, not too far from North Carroll. Um, one thing that our company has really been trying to do outside of our traditional uh, real estate development activities is is some community give back and we also have in, in, internally here a passion for in particular youth sports and um, we're actively under development of a, of a youth sports complex down in, in Anne Arundel County and um, a, an affiliate um, venture partner of ours uh, Capital Sports Group had been talking to Jack and, and the Economic Development Group about the North Carroll High School. Um, our company has uh, great development experience and we're very well capitalized. And, and this is a, a, a venture we're super excited about. Um, you know, our, our immediate plans are to, uh, once we get our contract signed, is to start on the design and engineering of the fields. And, um, and really, we want to maintain the integrity of the existing building. Um, we've already been in some preliminary conversations to the extent we, we've been allowed to with some of the, the local stakeholders. 
and um, you know our, our plan is to, to, to utilize the auditorium, the gymnasium, to, to maintain the relationship with the sheriff's department, and to construct four first-class multi-purpose fields right away. Um, and then you know that that the field construction and the the, the site uh, could grow uh, depending on demand. But um, you know that's 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 our goal, and we're really excited to partner with the community on that. Um, you know, and both in, in reusing the existing building and, and uh, repurposing the rest of the site and creating, you know, usable fields for both the local community and the greater region. So, well, Matt, can I interrupt you, Matt? Matt yeah. uh, you would talk, uh, talk about the turf fields. I mean, the amount of money you're going to be put in the turf fields and, you know, kind of the schedule in the turf fields. That's important. Well, yeah, we're still, we're still working through our budget. Our phase one budget, um, you know, is, is plus or minus $4 million. And, and, um, you know, right away we, you know, I don't have the ability to share a plan here online, but um, right away we were going to move forward with our first turf field. Um, we likely could do a second one in conjunction with that. And then there, the other fields that we would do would be, um, you know, the first class natural grass fields, not necessarily like what's there, but like you'd see at a college or, or, uh, or university. But yes, the, the plan is to right away, uh, as soon as we have the appropriate approvals um, and we close um, to move forward on the field construction. Okay. I, I, real quick, I want to ask, this, this building has a lot of uh, memorabilia and history to the community. Once it's developed, will part of the building be dedicated to highlight and preserve some of the history and memorabilia to that community? Because I think that's very important for that community. A lot of people graduate high school there. If there's something that can be done to maintain some of that history, I think the community would appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for bringing that up. I mean, we're, we're very sensitive to that. I mean, I only moved up there four years, so I wasn't a graduate of North Carroll High School, but I, I, I have quickly, I have quickly started to understand the history and the sentiment that the community has with the high school. Uh, we've already had some conversations with some people that have had other monuments and signs and, and scoreboards and stuff dedicated to families. We're very sensitive to that. We want to be part of the community as I am a, a person that lives there. We don't want to be somebody that comes in and tries to change history. So um, we actually, in our, in our presentations that we've been putting together, our, our intention is to, while we have, you know, a, a, a facility in Anne Arundel County, our intention is to actually name this the, Port, the Panther Sports Complex. So, um, yeah, we're, we're definitely going to be sensitive to that and, and appreciate you bringing that up because that's absolutely 100% our intention. Well, that was a wonderful reply. Thank you very much. Um, Matt, I know uh, you, you are sensitive to a lot of things in the community and really community uh, base is where we're heading here. What about the uh, town of Hampstead? Do you, um, I know you've met with them quite a bit, but you have their support? Um, yeah, my understanding is we do. Yeah. Hey, Matt, you mentioned um, phase one regarding the uh, plus or minus $4 million turf fields. Um, I guess, what is phase two and how many phases are you looking at this project? Well, I mean, it's, it's still pretty early and we haven't started spending all of our engineering and, and, and research dollars. Um, but, you know, phase one is definitely the delivery of those first four multi-purpose fields and making sure that we've got the building facilities, you know, being the gymnasium, the auditorium and, and, and other things up and running so that they can be utilized in conjunction. Um, with the fields, um, phase two would be the addition of, you know, potentially up to um, up to two more additional uh, fields, and then also creating other amenity spaces in and around the property for for uh, for people that are utilizing the field. So, you know, in the event we're able to bring, you know, some bigger tournaments um, outside of just the recreation uses, um, you know, with with the rec council, we'd want to have the ability for people to, you know have have amenities that serve um that that, that serve and we, we really want to work with the local community to bring some of the other you know restaurant owners and amenities um to help them have us provide that for people that are coming in from outside the area the uh the current services that the school and the fields provide for the rec programs and the sheriff's department is the intent for 
that to continue as uh, as you move forward? Absolutely, um, absolutely. And we've already, uh, as part of this negotiation with the county, um, have have come to, to general terms with the sheriff's department. And you know, we would obviously need to memorialize that. And we absolutely want to want to have the, uh, the the rec council's uses be the cornerstone of what we're going to do moving forward. All right. Any other questions for Matt? Jack, you know, ahead. this oh, 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 this has on. been okay. Now hold on a minute. Any any other questions for Matt before we get into to comments or whatever? Because I know Jack, you want to go down through some of the de details. I think here a couple of highlights. Yes. Yeah, but Commissioner so, Weaver had you were going to speak. I mean, I don't want to interrupt you. You were going to yeah. say something. Go ahead, Jack. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Jack. Uh, you know, we, we, you know, Matt, myself, and the whole group, and you know, our group here have been meeting with the mayor, and I can tell you that, um, you know, um, the, the mayor is on board with this. You know, all the meetings that we have, he is on board with this to answer your, your question, Commissioner Rostein. Um, the, some of the key the key factors on this is that um, there's a 180-day study period. That's the max, you know, that they would do, um, and they would settle within 30 days. Uh, but, you know, you know, I think Matt will tell you they would like to, you know, get, get started a little bit before 180 days, but the contract says 180-day study period. Um, 30 days settle settlement. The uh, I can tell you that that the county sheriff's is leasing about a little less than 5,000 square feet, but the uh, the contract states that you know, and then um, Chesapeake Real Estate Group uh, is not charging the the, um, the sheriff's department any uh, basic rent at all, and the contractor are just going to pay the utility bill. You know. A pro rata share on the on the fertility bill. Um, is that in perpetuity? Yeah, five years. I'm sorry, five years. Actually, no, it's for ten. Is it ten years? Yeah, um, it's actually yeah, it's actually ten, I believe. Is and it then, ten? Um, okay. Yeah, it was it was it was ten, and and uh, there was yeah, and there was no rent on the end of that initial five thousand square feet for ten years. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. The, uh, yeah, correct, my mind, correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, the, the, the deal would be a fee simple deal for the whole 50 acres um, plus the school. That's kind of the, the highlights, you know, uh, of, of the uh, the contract. Unless you've got, I know you've had a copy of the contract. There's anything, with, you know, you want to talk about in the contract. Any, any questions that we all have been provided a copy of that. We've had it for quite some time now. So if there's any questions on that, we can go with that. Jack, do you have anything else I, before we hear from, I, we need to hear from Commissioner Weaver on this. Uh, no, you know, after, after negotiating with this, you know, I think it's the best, you know, the deal, let's say, that we have out there, but it satisfies what the community wanted what the town wanted, and, you know, the citizens of Carroll County, you know, I, I think this is a great asset and it's going to bring a lot of people into the county. Um, and it will increase the tax base, but it also, um, you know, will highlight the county and, and put us on the map for, you know, athletic, especially with the turf fields. You know, I, I personally in this department, you know, we, we recommend that you, uh, you know, you accept this contract, you know, you know, I'll, I'll stop talking turn it over to the commissioners. <laughs> uh, Commissioner Frazier, you have a question. I do have a question on page seven about real estate taxes. We've talked about this before. Um, it, it, maybe you just, like, just explain that part to me, Jack, uh, real estate taxes, because what it says, and I don't want to, it just, it looks to me like we're going to look, we're basically uh, going to lease the fields and the and the uh, gymnasium out in lieu of the $60,000 up to $60,000 real estate taxes. However, there's a spot in there where it says, in the event the county contracts for the, and utilizes for the fields, buildings resulting in the amount greater than $60,000 cap, 
reference here and all fees will be due. Does that mean the cap doesn't actually mean anything? Uh, that, that one sentence kind of throws the rest of it off for me. Uh, Matt, you want to you want to explain that one? Yeah, sure. I guess the the, the real estate tax piece, you know, that we're, we're we're obviously working on trying to get this building assessed or something that's that's um, palatable for somebody that's renting, you know, fields to other people for market rates, right? I mean, paying. Uh, there's a reason that. Um, that, that buildings uh, like auditoriums and gymnasiums aren't built on a speculative basis because they're, 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 they're too expensive to operate. So, yeah. And, and the goal there was, is we, we had had a, we, we had structured a deal where um, the, 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 the county would, would be able to help reimburse us for our tax bill while we're working through the first phase of this. And in doing that, um, we would do that in, in a fashion where, um, we would have some guaranteed use and rental income from the county on fields and on gymnasium and on whatever else they need. Um, and it was at the, uh, the county's request that we put a, a cap on that. Um, so we did that. So there will be that sort of bucket, which is a reimbursement of a tax bill. And then, you know, in the event, if the county decides that, hey, they want to use these fields seven days a week, 24 hours a day, okay, well, there's going to be a component of that that will – obviously need to be compensated for and so once we get you know we, we kind of use that sixty thousand dollar piece as the the tax reimbursement piece in the event it's that high hopefully the assessment will come in and it's not it's going to be you know especially if this if, if you know when the trade goes hopefully it'll be considerably less than that uh, but that right. that was the tax piece that we wanted outlined in the contract and then you know then once we get above that there will there will be compensation for fields you know um as needed the, the county is appealing that, Commissioner. Uh, uh, we'll be appealing that the first of the year. Matt and I have talked to the, the state tax assessor to try to get that number more realistically because, you know, there there's about um, $20 million that needs to be spent inside the building with the new roof and with the HVAC, the electrical, and everything else. And we, we've been talking to tax assessor. He said, go ahead and appeal the process. But we thought... You know, if, if that doesn't happen, you know, on the on the appeal that you know, right now the it's uh, it's, that's why we put the not to exceed sixty thousand dollars for the five years. Right for the for the, my understanding was that it was going to be not to exceed the sixty thousand dollars, but that was capped at that, and that we we could use the fields in the gymnasium. But now it's we can use the fields in the gymnasium. Once the rent hits the sixty thousand dollars, then we're paying additional to that, and that's that's what this says, correct? That is correct. Okay, that I have to say that wasn't the understanding I had before I read the contract. But if everybody else is fine with that, then okay. Yeah, I read that part too. I saw that, and that was different than what we had discussed right. before. But I'm I'm actually good with that. So I don't know. I mean, it, it, as I'm sitting back listening to it, does it make sense? Yes, it does. Right. Because these people right. are here to try to make money. Let's face the facts. Yeah, right. But I'm just pointing out that that's not this different than what we originally thought. That that's all I'm saying. Right. Okay. Hey, Jack. Um, the uh, 180 day study period. You said that, and and Matt, you can answer this as well. You said that the intent is to go. Uh, much earlier than that. So why are we putting 180 days? Why not 120 days? And, you know, start from there. I mean, get, get this thing moving because that's that's the whole idea is the way, you know, Matt, you sounded, you you were, there's a lot of energy in getting this going. So why the 180? Is that just the standard or can we do it at 90 or 120? Jack, do you want me to take that or? Yeah, you need to take that, Matt, because, okay. you know. Yeah, yeah, no. And, yeah, no, thanks for the question. There definitely was some thought behind that. We actually sat in our initial meeting with with Jack and a couple of the uh, the department heads in the county, um, you know, over in the, over, over in the pavilion, uh, outdoor pavilion, sort of talking backwards through um, what it would take for us to get all of our appropriate approvals and entitlements to do the field construction. And, and we would love for it to move faster as well. And, and if you look into the sort of the finer points of the contracts and conditions precedent to closing are us getting the approvals. And so we, w while we're excited to move forward and, and, and we can't close,
close until we know that we're going to be able to execute on our development plan, and the development plan is the construction of the fields. So if we get the approvals ahead of the six months, um, we're, we're fine closing ahead of the six months. That, that, that was the method to, to, to why we, the, the dates were set there. Um, because we've got to get it, and it's going to be a lot of engineering cost and time. And so to get the drawings done, submitted, reviewed, um, commented on, resubmitted, um, dealing with stormwater management, everything else that we've got to do, um, it's it's not going to be a, you know, it's not like buying an, just buying a building and saying, hey, it's, you know, we'll own it in 60 days. It's We need to have our entitlements um, so that we can go ahead and construct the fields. Yeah, Commissioner, we did meet with uh with Tom Double Bliss and, and with the, the town, there was about, I guess, about 14 of us at this meeting uh, in the pavilion uh, about uh, three months ago. We went through that they're going to uh, follow a modified site plan in the town. And we went through, and, and our schedule said uh, that it would take you at least, it would take five months for them to get the permits. You know, that's the best case scenario. So we, we said, you know, we didn't want to go in the next year and you know we kind of we kind of said five months to get all your permits and so we just added the extra month you know how that goes and we did we said 180 days but it's going to take at least we, we've all committed to want to say we the county tom and the, the um the you know the town to at least 150 it's going to at least be 150 days so why so why can't we put <clears throat> as an incentive to get it done uh you know, the study period upon permitting completion or upon the, you know, uh, yeah, permits uh, awarded or 180 days, you know, whichever comes first. I mean, because if, if if we can get this thing done sooner, you know, through permits and some more management, that gives us an incentive to get this thing moving. You know, I would like that as opposed to putting just a fixed date on it. Well, I know the intent from Chesapeake is to get this done as soon as possible. You know, right, but, right. Yeah. yeah, the way the way I read it is is due diligence. Uh, the way I read it is it's up to 180 days. So any time before that would be acceptable. That's yes, the, that's the cap. So that's the way I yeah, read it. We, I, don't wanna, I don't I don't know. And Matt, correct me if I'm wrong with your group, but I, I don't think we want to put it. It is your intent to do it. 180 or less. Correct. The faster we can start construction, the faster we can have the fields open for use and for programming. That's correct. So, as soon, and and so that's absolutely the intention. And I, I thought that that was the way it, that was the way it read. But I mean, you know, the concept is if you know if we want to say something like, hey, well, the settlement will be 30 days, you know, within 30 days following uh, receipt of permits, not to be later than. June 30th of 20, which keeps you within your fiscal year, not to be later than June 30th of 2021. That's fine too. For us, it's all about the permitting. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, I just think, okay. I don't want to add a whole lot of extra language here. I think the intent is there and it, it I think that you're going to, you're going to get it done as soon as you can. So that's correct. I'd like, yeah, I'd like to keep that part. A lot of this is in our hands, stormwater management and things. We can, the faster it gets through, the faster we settle. Right. That's a good point, too, Dick. We can, we, well, we've kind of got the uh, accelerator here. <laughs> well, well, much, of it, would, much of it is in the town's hands. It's the town planning commission. The town has to change the zoning. So those things also have to. Yeah, understood. I have another question on the fields and the use of gymnasium, because this is important. Um, since we're more or less guaranteeing $60,000 a year to the company, which is fine, do we have, do schools, our public schools and our recreation, recreation departments have first use of the fields and the gymnasium when they need them? I'm, I'm not saying that, it, let's say six months from now, there's a tournament scheduled, we're not gonna bump them out. That's not what I'm saying. But if we're trying to schedule, if the schedule's being made and we're, we need this for our high schools or we need it for recreation department, before the schedule is set with something else, we should have first, first, I guess, um, right to use that stuff because we're guaranteeing this money. Amash? 
Yeah, I mean, we, we uh, look, yeah, it's our, it's our intention to try to take care of the community first. We've not gotten into the, the actual programming and scheduling as we don't know when we're going to be delivering stuff. Right. Um, but for practices and weekday activities, you know, that's absolutely our intention. I think if you, yeah, that, I mean, that, that would be our intention. But right now, you know, we, we, I don't have the ability to sit there and, and, and look at a schedule and guarantee who's going to get what. But it would right. make sense just, that our rec council's right that our rec council's right there, and that and and people that are coming from outside the community are not going to come up here for practices and games on a regular basis. Right. I just want to make sure that 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 that's the understanding. I know there's no schedule. The fields aren't even haven't even started them yet. I understand all that. I just want to make sure that that's the understanding that the rec rec councils and the high schools and and you know the our systems are basically our priority in, in, in use of the fields in the gymnasium. Correct. Or at least, right, okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any other questions on this? Commissioner Weaver? Well, you know, this has been a four year process, and Steve, you uh, had the same type of situation that Charles Carroll uh, dealing with, and Eric, I know you've inherited one, but Jack seemed to. I solved that one before you got in office with uh, uh, New Windsor Metal. But I've met with all kinds of groups. We've looked at schools. We've had community meetings. We've dealt with a whole kind of issues uh, dealing with the North Carroll group uh, and the previous Board of Education and superintendents that they didn't want it as a school. The new Board of Education and the new superintendent said, no, we do not need this site as a school. Uh, and that threw that one out totally. Uh, now we're looking at, uh, and this is not the first group I've met with either as far as a, a sports center, but this group, and I will say Chesapeake Real Estate Group has it together. They have uh, met with the town. I've been in meetings with both. Uh, Jack has uh, put it together. They have developed a plan uh, that is uh, unique, I think, compared to anything else. I am firmly convinced this is the best uh, uh, agreement we've come up with at this to this point. And uh, they have uh, uh, the fact that they're so community oriented and uh, willing to work with the town, work, work with the county. Uh, this will be a boost for Carroll County. And I think uh, economic development deserves a lot of credit. Uh, for putting this together, and if this all comes out the way uh, it's envisioned, uh, it'll put Carroll County on the map. And I know they've had a lot of people looking at this site, looking at where their work can go, and um, this will be a whole boost to the county. Now, it's not centralized in the county, uh, perhaps, but maybe that's a good thing, too, because it is out away from some congestion and will make... Um, uh, a, a difference for all the youth sports uh, regionally. So uh, I am, uh, I, and Steve, I do want to make the motion on this that we accept this uh, uh, agreement of sale uh, to with the uh, Chesapeake Real Estate Group. Second. Yeah, hold on, hold on oh, a second. Sorry. Hold on a second. Before that, that's not a that's not a formal motion yet. But uh, yeah, Dick, you're going to get that. Well, Tim, Tim, did you have something? Yes, if we're going to make a motion, uh, can I suggest some language? Sure. I think we appro approve the sale of North Carroll High School uh, to Chesapeake Real Estate Group LLC uh, for $1 million and other terms as discussed today to be finalized in a contract of sale, just to make sure we're all working from the same contract of sale. I'm sure we are. But just... There have been various iterations of the contract throughout the last months. Okay. All right. Did you get that, uh, Commissioner Weaver? <laughs> That's just what I said. <laughs> said it better than I did. It comes across differently. Reply. <laughs> reply. And I'll second that. <laughs> okay. Uh, we've got the we've got the correct language now, and uh, Commissioner Weaver, you have uh, advised that that is the language in your motion. And Commissioner Rothstein, you have seconded. Are there any other questions for Jack or Matt or anything on this 
uh, item. Not, not a question, just a comment. And uh, that is to applaud again, Jack and the community up in Hampstead uh, and everyone coming together and coming up with, I believe, a very good solution in taking care of a community uh, in our county and the county at whole, uh, at, in whole. So really good, good work, Jack. And uh, look forward to the partnership, Matt and your team in making a true success up there in Hampstead. Thank you. I would like to add that I'm very happy that this has finally happened. We've been working on us, us three the, from, yeah. from the previous board since this happened. We looked at suspension. We were said numerous people wanting to do things with this and back and forth. And so I'm, I'm so happy this is finally moving forward. I'm just, I can't express how happy I'm about this. Yeah. And I'll tag, I'll tag along on those comments, Dennis. This has been, uh, well, quite, quite frankly, I, the only way that I can title it is it's been a nightmare ever since its inception. Uh, and I think we've made some in, incredibly good and positive choices with all three properties that were thrown in our lap as a result of this. And, uh, I, you know, we, we, we took care of the New Windsor situation. Uh, Dick, you mentioned we took care of the, of the uh, Silver Run situation. And now we've taken care of what uh, the man, the Hampstead situation, and I think we're in a, I think we're in a good place. So, uh, any other comments on this? Uh, I just want to thank you, you know, know, commissioners, for your your leadership on this. Um, and thank you for hanging in there with uh, Matt and I over the nine months. You know, I know you've been involved all year, but but thank you very much, so. Commissioner Weaver. You know, we've made lemons, lemonade out of lemons, uh, and we've had some issues, and you're right, we've uh, experienced uh, a lot of uh, negativity in this, but uh, hopefully we can turn it around, and uh, I have a great deal of uh, uh, <coughs> uh, confidence in the Chesapeake group to make this happen, uh, more so than I have with anything, so uh, I I'm just thrilled at this point. All right, Mr. Burke, before we take this vote, I saw you were you, you had your microphone on green. Go ahead. I just wanted to remind the, the public that this was a, a public sale. This property has been for sale for years. Anyone uh, was able to put bids on it or proposals. Okay. All right, anything else? It's another big vote. This is another big vote, another... Uh, part of history here in Carroll. All those in favor of the motion. And that is unanimous. Uh, Matt, we want to thank you for being on today and answering the questions. We wish you uh, the best of luck in the venture over there. Jack, we want to thank you and your department as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much from Chesapeake and thank you to Jack and look forward to working with everybody. Okay. All right, we're gonna move forward. Uh, next on our agenda, um, you, you know, be, before we move forward, uh, you know, Dick, one thing that you said in this, you know, we, we've, all, we've all been surrounded by negativity with all three of these, these properties. We've, we've, gotten, we've gotten personal attacks uh, there's been a, a lot of, of uh, a lot of uh, negativity in a lot of these communities, and and you're right with the lemons out of lemonade out of lemons uh, uh, comment. You're you're spot on there, Dick. And I want to thank you for your leadership too throughout this thing. You know, Dennis, you, Dick, and I, we we we've been through a lot with this thing, uh, with these three properties, and it it's been uh, it's been a long road, so. I just wanted to say that before we move on, because this, this was a huge decision today. So thank you. All right, we've got a public hearing up next for the financial assurance plan required by the Maryland Environment article. And for that, uh, we're gonna uh, first turn it over to Tom Devilbiss, our Director of Land and Resource Management. Uh, Chris Hine is on here, our Bureau Chief, to give us a presentation. And then we'll have the hearing conducted by our county attorney, Tim Burke. But first, Mr. Devilbiss.
Thank you, commissioners. Good morning. Yes, we are here today for a public hearing regarding the financial assurance plan, which we refer to as FAP, which is required by the Maryland Environment Article 4-202. If you'll recall, we gave a full presentation to the Board of County Commissioners on November 19th, uh, at which time the board approved moving to this public hearing process. After that, we then put a notice of the public hearing onto the county's website. It was posted on November 19th. Along with that posting went the presentation that we presented on the 19th, as, long as, all, as well as all the financial assurance documents that go along with the submittal. As a reminder, uh, we have to submit this document by December 29th of 2020 per the requirements in the state law. This uh, information that we are generating and thus providing to state uh, provides uh, proof to the state that the Watershed Protection Restoration Fund and the stormwater mitigation projects that we do through our National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Municipal Separate Storm Sewer Permit are complied with both in the immediate future and extended out to a five-year period. What we have to do is we have to provide that uh, sufficient funding uh, that is required to meet the program and the permit requirements there. After the uh, submittal of this document, the Maryland Department of Empowerment will post it on their website for 14 days, at which time they'll take comments from the public. Uh, they will then take those comments along with our document and they will evaluate our document and within 90 days they will make sure that we are in compliance with the permitting requirements uh, with the MPDES MS4 permit. That document then will be compiled with others from the other jurisdictions who have similar permits to us and there are 10 of us in the state of Maryland. They will be compiled in a, in a report that is we submit excuse me, sent to the governor and to the environmental committees of the Maryland legislature by September 1st. And an overall report then is released for public uh, information uh, after that is done. It, re it then compares all the jurisdictions, uh, both individually and together, as in uh, regarding compliance with the MPDS permit. And again, this process is repeated every two years. So this is and began in uh, 2016. So this is the third financial assurance plan presentation to the board uh, public hearing that we have had since the legislation was passed. And again, this public hearing is a requirement and your hopefully approval, ultimate approval of this plan is necessary to comply with the uh, terms of the legislation. So with that, um, I will say, is there, well, let me go, excuse me, go ahead. One more slide we have here, which is basically a compilation of the, what was required in the financial assurance plan. And what it basically does is compares the revenues that we are estimated to have, and these are both, both operating and capital costs for our program compared to the actual costs that we project. And as you can see, uh, we have to go out to the, FY 2025, that is a requirement. The main item that we have to show them is compliance within the first two years of this submittal. And as you can see that we have balanced both our revenue and our costs for this financial assurance plan. The main thing I really wanna to stress to you and the, and the viewing public is we have not, this is not altering our proposed budget that you approved uh, uh, for FY21 and beyond, this is not altered that at all. We are following and in compliance with that plan that was provided to the Board of County Commissioners and approved by them through FY25 for the uh, capital costs. And we have also projected our operating costs based on our what we project will be those operating costs uh, into the future. So nothing here is is suggesting or increasing anything that we have not previously brought before you or you have approved for us for our program and implementation through FY 2025. So with that, we will entertain questions by the uh, county commissioners, both myself and Mr. Chris Henn, who's the Bureau Chief of Resource Management. 
uh, we'll, or at your disposal for any questions you may have regarding the financial assurance plan. Any questions for Tom or Chris? All right, Hear, hearing none, then I guess we'll get into the public hearing. Uh, Tim Burke, you wanna, you wanna run this show for us? Yes, it's likely to be pretty short, I think. Are there any members of the public uh, with any comments on the proposed uh, FAP plan? Yeah, I believe we've got one caller on the line. Is that right, Chris? Correct. Uh, oh, and wait work. a minute. <laughs> they just left. I and, heard you say that. <laughs> and, and, appar and apparently, Mr. Burke, they agree with you because they quickly <laughs> left. Well, let's give so, him five yeah. seconds to, to call back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you want to talk amongst yourselves while we wait for him to call back? Or I don't know. <laughs> I think scared him off. Awesome. Yeah. There's tours involved with these programs. I'm all about it. <laughs> okay. Well, Mr. President, it appears we have no public comments uh, at this public hearing. All right. Thank you, Mr. Burke. All right. Uh, well, with with that, I'll say with that, I'll make the motion that we close the public hearing and leave the record open for seven days. Second. All right. Got a motion and second. All those in favor? And that's unanimous. Uh, Tom, Chris, thank you for your work on this. Very good, commissioners. Thank you very much. Um, I can't credit staff enough with, with what they do to both comply with, with what we are required to do and also to plan for it. it it's, it's almost of equal efforts, as you can tell from this plan. Uh, not only just implementing it, but planning for it. Very good, okay. All right. Thank you all very much. We'll move on. Uh, next item on our agenda. Could, could I take a moment really quickly while Chris and, and Tom are here? Sure, Roberta. Or, I, oh, there I you are. That. Sorry. Yep. I, I have been remiss in um, relaying a, a very, very nice phone call I received um, late last week um, complimenting um, Tom and um, Chris and their entire staff in development review and um, water resources. Myron Frock and Martin Covington and Clay Black um, and now Laura Matthias and others um, for their excellent work. Um, the developer who developed a, a recent 7-Eleven down the Eldersburg area could not sing their praises any higher for the um, professionalism and um, their, their uh, you know, uh, uh, customer service and working with them. And so I thought it would be, this is a nice time to give them those kudos. So thank you. Very good, thank you, Roberta. And uh, you know, we can't we can't say it enough the, the work that goes on behind the scenes for for a lot of these projects in the county start with with uh, with the efforts of of you guys when it comes to stormwater management and what have you. So you, you all do a tremendous job, and not only with that, but with all the projects, of, you know, obtaining the grant monies and and what have you. It's just. Uh, it's remarkable, and uh, that's why I get a little bit upset, as do my colleagues, when MDE comes after us. Because how can you, how, how can you improve on perfection? I, I guess you can. Maybe that's like that hope thing that Commissioner Rothstein talks about. I don't know, but um, but you know, it's tough. It's tough to, it's tough to uh, to improve on when you're doing what we feel is is the best in the state of Maryland. So uh, thank you all. And there's, that's a good example of folks in our community realizing that as well. Well done. I'd just like to very quickly add that that leadership starts with our administrator and works its way down. So thank you very much, Administrator Wynnum. Well, thank you. I didn't expect that. Yeah, the gentleman hopes to uh, make uh, develop many more projects in Carroll County since we were so easy to work. Thank you. And Mr. Hine, before we let you go, when we do that tour, that stream management of Commissioner Wentz, make sure he does not bring a shovel. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, I, I have access to several shovels. Just to, uh, <laughs> All right. Thank you guys very much. All right. We're well, moving you. on.
<laughs> we're moving on to uh, exercising the option, option to purchase uh, a property through the county uh, ag preservation program. And I know that Deb is on here and Tom as well. So whoever wants to take this, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Let, let me begin, commissioners. Um, what we have is, this okay. is an add-on to an existing uh, ag preservation easement. And we were before you, I believe it was September 3rd for this property. Um, and so what I'd just like to do is just remind you that, that we have an existing easement of which the property owners purchased an additional piece of land that they would like to add on to. This is located at 2501 Cross Section Road um, in Westminster. So I'll turn it over to Deb to give you all the details. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. Um, as Tom says, this is an existing uh, original county easement, um, as you can see there on your screen. It's only been a couple of years. Um, and the owners have recently purchased a parcel at, right in front of their property, as you can see on the screen, um, to be added. That's 3.4 acres. They're very happy to have been able to purchase it. It is all woodland, but they are presenting um, that becoming a residential lot, a non-farm neighbor. That's their interest in uh, purchasing that. So um, what we do in a case like this is we allow the deed of easement to be amended in terms of how many acres it covers. And we um, offer to pay them the same amount per acre that they uh, received for the original deed of easement. So in this case, for the 3.4 acres, the cost is uh, $13,506, and um, they are retiring one additional lot right. So what we do is we produce an amended deed of easement, and that gets recorded in the land records. So um, that's what we're looking at here. Here is um, just another view of what that um, This shows the original easement and the uh, the amended easement total acreage would be 89.9 acres. And um, so with that, we are requesting final approval for this uh, amended deed of easement with add-on acreage. Okay, any okay. questions on this? property uh, I'm very familiar with this with this uh, with this land and it sits in a really good spot and it's perfect for our preservation program obviously because it was majority of it was before but now adding this is is, uh, is a great advantage over here um, so with that I'll make the motion that we approve the add-on of 3.245 acres to the Windish property through amendment to the existing county held easement. Second. Second. Yeah, Weaver. All right, got a motion and second. Any other questions? All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you, Deb and JP. Thank you, Tom. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you all. All right. Next on our agenda is approval to proceed to public hearing uh, on commercial permit fees for utility use group structures. And oh, I'll, just leave, I'll just leave the, uh, I'll just leave the, uh, you, you gotta love virtual. I'll, I'll, just, <laughs> I'll, just, uh, <laughs> I'll just leave the, uh, the description of what we're doing here with that because we'll hear more from uh, Jason Green, our Deputy Director of Public Works, and our Bureau Chief, uh, Mike Snepp, down in Permits and Inspections. Just to set the stage here, uh, this is something that uh, that we uh, that I actually started working on a little bit with Jason when we were uh, trying to get uh, a little bit better uh, fee structure 
for a, a large facility in the northern part of my district and and try to get a little bit more common sense when it comes to the, the fees that are charged uh and with that i'll leave it if that sets the stage i'll turn it over to jason jason good morning good morning commissioner sorry about that having some a little technical difficulties again rather frustrating um <laughs> if you're the Bureau of Permits and Inspections is responsible for billing of permit fees. Uh, these fees are set with the goal of providing operational funds for the services provided. The board did request the Bureau to review the current permit fee structure related to commercial agricultural type buildings. Uh, this change would apply to structures such as greenhouses, stables, livestock shelters, and other agricultural buildings located in a commercial setting. Due to the nature of construction, typically found in these type structures. The calculated staff time is less than a traditional commercial building. Much of the cost falls into two categories, a permit fee, which covers costs associated with the permits office and a fire protection plan review fee for the Office of Public Safety. Uh, the chart uh, that was provided to you in your packet outlines what the fee is currently and the levels at which it could be reduced. So in your uh, packet, you should have a chart that shows um, three different levels. The first particular portion is what is charged for the permit office uh, staffing requirements. Um, and it, there's a couple of different levels there showing you the amount of square footage. Uh, for examples, there's five different, there's a 10,000, 20, 30, and 40 and 50,000 examples of that, what that fee would be for those size structures. The second portion of that particular chart shows you what the fire plan review fee would be for those same size structures. And then the third portion of the chart that's been provided to you shows you the overall fee for those type structures. So what, what we can do it is on the back end of our um, Acela system is reduce the actual commercial fee by these percentages when a particular um, agricultural commercial building is, is built. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions you may have. Mr. Green, is there a link between the fee and the time we use, I mean, is there a cost basis to determine this fee? What's the rationale to develop these numbers? There is a cost basis there. And, and with any permit, it's not specifically going to cover or be in excess of a specific uh, permit application. So there are times where we may get a little bit more than the work we actually perform, but there are also instances where we get less than the actual work we perform. So there's not, it's not an exact science. I remember we just went through all these other fees, analyzing their actual labor costs and linking it to the fee. So there's no process like that in place for this? No, there's not. Each, each job's pretty, pretty specific in, you know, how much time it may take to process a particular permit, depending on the complex, how complex the, the project is. Um, and there are also instances where there are more um, inspections built into particular jobs that uh, that aren't that may or may not be accounted for. Is there any way to potentially set a system up where there's a cost relation to the fee? Because I still feel like these numbers are quite arbitrary. Uh, again, I think it would be. We we probably I don't know how many years ago, but we had a, a very complex system of permit fee calculations. I think there were 180 different um, ways to calculate a permit fee. And it, it was very difficult to, to uh, provide citizens and contractors and businesses with information with regards to what their permit fee would be with that type of system. So we simplified it so both staff and the public could easily ascertain what a given cost for a given project would be. Sometimes these costs are uh, built into their planning phases of the project before they even you know, start the project and, and are just basically gathering information to get started. So this has, you know, led to a much more simpler process. Um, and to date, I have not heard of any complaints with regards to the, uh, with the permit fees. Most, most folks that we have are in contact with are pleased with the, uh, with the costs associated with our fees in comparison to other counties. Presently, Jason, what does it cost to put an agricultural building up if they come in and present the plans? Uh, as far as as far as the cost for an agricultural building, I mean, a standard pole building can run just a small unit can run, you know, 30 to 30 to 40 to $50,000. Some of these larger units that are 100, 150, you know, foot long, 
um, there's there's some substantial costs associated with those particular with those particular buildings. No, no, for the the uh, fee permit fee. Uh, the the fee permit fee. Yeah, yeah, I mean for uh, and and this this um for for an ag building that's located on a uh, family farm, those particular permits are still will remain um, one hundred dollars. These are strictly for commercial buildings. So in, in the chart, as identified, a 10,000 square foot commercial agricultural building um, would cost $2,800 in permit fees. And that includes both the permit uh, staffing support and then also the uh, commercial fire protection plan review that's now done by the Office of Public Safety. I'd feel more comfortable okay. if I knew what the cost was Lincoln is at twenty eight hundred dollars. What what's their expense? Yeah, we we do not we do not have those particular numbers, um, but the the particular process is processing the permit and also facilitating that process from um, as soon as it's applied to the issuance of the use and occupancy. You have the plan review portion of it, which generally a, a commercial plan can take anywhere from two to three hours. Some of that is back and forth with the given client to gain, get other information um, and, you know, potentially revise plans, things like that. And then the other portion of that is the inspection. So from, you know, from the footer all the way up to the completion of the project, our inspectors are going out to the site to, to perform the inspections. So all that entire operation associated with that permit is captured in these particular costs. Um, to my knowledge, there's never been a specific study done to say, okay, if we did a 10,000 square foot building, um, you know, how much actual staff time are we taking in that particular building? How many particular trips do we make to that site? There are just, there are just many variables that will, um, we, we could obviously get a range of that, but there are variables associated with that particular process. Yeah, Jason, but you're, you're, you're asking us to make a decision on reducing these fees for this type of building because tip, um, and here said it takes a lot less staff time to do these particular um, permits. So in order for us to make an uh, a informed decision, we need to know how much less staff time it actually takes. Because if the typical fee is $2,000, I'm just looking at the first one, for 10,000 square foot, okay, and but for this particular type of building, it takes less staff time. Is it like 75% or 25% less, less staff time? Is it half the time? In order to, to, to come up with something that I feel comfortable with talking about, are, are you know putting forward i'd have to know how much less staff time it, it takes and i think that's what commissioner boucher is getting at as well yeah again just speaking with on general terms the, the processing of a permit um there's really no time saved on that with regards to an agricultural permit there's still you know the, the the permit is still taken into the system the paperwork is still processed the uno is still issued so there's really no time saved there the plan review portion of that there could be some time saved there when, you, when you're comparing an office building to a particular agricultural building where it's just typically exterior walls and things like that. Um, there's much less detail um, uh, in regard to that particular plan review uh, job. So an agricultural building may take uh, two to three hours. A big commercial site that, that could take um, that, that could take a full day or even several days to uh, to review the uh, the inspection portion. Again, when you're dealing with uh, internal construction on a office building, there are a lot of framing inspections, electrical inspections, and things like that associated uh, with the particular interior of a structure. Whereas the agricultural building, you're basically just dealing with a, um, a footer inspection and a framing and a final inspection. And sometimes there are some supplementary inspections uh, in there. So from a processing standpoint, there's no difference. From a plan review processing part, there's probably about a one third difference and then from an inspection standpoint, I would say there's probably about maybe a, uh, a half um, to one third difference. You know, going back where Commissioner Boucher was talking, and I agree with him that, you know, we don't want to throw out arbitrary numbers. Um, it is difficult, you know, if we make this too complex because then the developer, the builder, the owner, you know, doesn't know how much to put aside or how much, you know, to put into the, uh, into the project. Um, there's, there's gotta, 
be a way to keeping this thing simple uh, without being so, again, throwing these arbitrary numbers out there, I feel. Um, you know, when we looked at fees last time and we raised the fees, I was not in favor of doing that. I own it. We agreed to it as, you know, as a board. But the arguments that were made uh, in doing it was the cost associated with the man hours and activities uh, surrounding, you know, the permits and the fees. Um, I just, I didn't agree that it had to be so dramatic, but we're not doing that here. And if you can give us more details on what the cost would be, I mean, I think you're starting to get there, but still, you know, I don't know, whole numbers always scare me like this. So uh, just, just thoughts. So a lot of counties only have a set fee on this, don't they, Jason? If any fee. Yeah, each county really sets their own fee schedules. Uh, a lot of them do the square footage. Some of them, uh, depending on what they classify it at, uh, whether it's a full-blown agricultural building or a commercial site. Um, in some cases, if, it, if they classify it as agricultural, then there's no fee applied to it. Yes, that is correct. I'd like to possibly see if we could go back and audit what we did the previous year, how many buildings were done, how many man hours. I'm not comfortable with these figures going up per square footage at the same cost in volume. As someone who bids a lot of work, once I start going up in volume, I start discounting the cost. So the higher someone goes up in square footage, the amount they should be paying in square footage should actually drop down some because it's already a mass in the lower level. If we could have some sort of audit and give you a better feel and understand what the cost that we're associating with this to link it to the expense, I'd love to see that type of report. It don't have to be too in depth, but just give us a better feel. I, I just don't feel very comfortable arbitrarily, just as Commissioner Rothstein has stated, going into this after we went back and reviewed all these other fees. If we can get a little bit more knowledge, I'd feel more comfortable about this. I agree with you. Yeah, well, I'm, I don't know that I do. Uh, I, I'm not sure where arbitrary is coming from. I mean, clearly we've set, they've set the chart here to show that uh, there's three options here, 75%, 50%, or 25% of the current costs uh, of what we would charge. So the original intent here and why I brought it up in the first place is because this particular business, and I'm not going to get into the names because that's not necessary here, but this particular business uh, pays uh, an enormous amount of fees uh, to to construct uh, their commercial building, and then on top of that, the taxes that are associated with that building as a result of it being there uh, are, are huge. So I looked upon this as helping our business community because these would be commercial structures helping our business community save some costs out of the gate uh, in order to not sort of double dip them if you will that's that's where I was going with this so I didn't want to make this complicated and have charts and 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 you know comparisons and and all of that I was just merely looking for a nice flat fee to help our commercial and business community. That was the intent of bringing this up. So I'm not sure where the arbitrary words coming from. I mean, you've given us three options here. What, I don't, I don't understand why that's arbitrary. Make, so, help, so me, what, help me, yeah. to, help me to, help me to identify that because I'm not seeing it. According to so this, okay. if we go with 25% based on your square footage, here, here would, here's what the fee would be. Let's well, take the think... word arbitrary out of it, and let's let's look at what the fees increase that we, as a board of commissioners, uh, voted on, um, and the effects that it's had uh, in the in the county. And a lot of it had to do with a lot of development, especially in the southern part of the county. You know where fees were increased. Um, and... See, I'm not. I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not trying to go there again. I'm trying to make this specific on agricultural commercial buildings. Right. I'm not talking about going all the way back and doing all these fees again. 
No, I, I, I know you're that, not. I'm not, I'm, I'm not interested in it because I'm but I don't then why, why aren't we? No, I, I get it. But we made these adjustments during the budget season when we had opened up a budget, didn't we? When we when we talked about fees. So why aren't we doing this during that time? I mean, I, we don't necessarily. I don't know. We don't necessarily. I, I don't know. Yeah, we don't necessarily do fee structure as part of budget. It's just it comes okay. up when it comes up. The only thing I'm saying about this is that the sentence in here in, in the briefing paper, due to the nature of construction typically found in these type of structures, to calculate staff time is much less. What does much less mean? Because if you want to have charged less, is it 25% less? And then and that, and if it is, that's fine. Then we should be charging 75 75% of what the uh, actual fee is is it fifty percent less? Then I could go with that, but I need to know, and I think that's what that we're all kind of fumbling around for. Much less, how much less? Is it half the amount of time? Then we'll charge half, because I still would like to uh, get back the money that that, or as close to getting back the money that we can for the staff time that's put in there. So if it's much less staff time, how much less staff time it is, and then we can make a decision. On what this chart says well that's what i think is what we need to know okay well without without delving in and getting five more charts in front of us can't that question be answered by either yourself jason or mike well in, again in general terms i mean we could talk about ranges because again each building is particularly different from the prop from the processing perspective there is no there is no staff savings time there from a um plan review portion, um, you know, we've done no, no specific calculation on this. So this is just purely based on the experience that I have in the department. And Mike, you can chime into this as well. But a typical building like that would take anywhere from, you know, a two to three hours to do it, the plan review, whereas a commercial structure could take up to a day or more to do a plan review. So, and again, the inspections along the same lines, we, with a commercial building, we, we, we're out there every day, every, every other day for our office building and things like that to do those inspections. Whereas this type of building, um, we might be out there once a week. So we can certainly calculate that and put that in a chart for you so you have a better understanding as, you know, a typical, typical commercial building. This is how many um, hours and how many visits we make compared to what this type of building um, compares to. We, we can certainly put that together for you. I'm all for Commissioner Wance's motive here. I think it's fantastic. I just want to make sure that whatever cut we have is good and deep because what Mr. Green is telling us, we could potentially slash these figures or permit fees even lower, but we just don't know where that point is. If we had a little bit more data, I'd love to slash these things even more than 75%. If you can justify the numbers, we can deliver this to these farmers. I, I just question a couple of things here. Greenhouse structures are not considered permanent structures uh, by insurance companies. They are not uh, a permanent structure. So, and a livestock shelter, what is the uh, definition of livestock shelter? Usually they don't have a whole lot of uh, <clears throat> extra things in them. I mean, why are we even full with this? Well, again, these are specifically commercial sites. So a livestock shelter could be something such as um, a slaughterhouse or something like that, which we have a few of those uh, within the county that's operating as a commercial entity um, where they're, they have workers in there, they have, uh, they're moving uh, cattle or something like that in and out. So that's where the livestock shelter would be. The stable portion of that would be uh, specifically like a riding arena that has spectator type areas there for the public to come to those type things is what we would look at. Yeah, the other thing to remember here too is I don't think there's, I don't think there's a lot of these that we would have. This is a very, this is a very uh, small uh, group of, of buildings that we would be talking about here too, which I think is important to keep in mind because uh, again, to, 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 I hate to bring it up again, but this came up as a result of, of a business that is typically greenhouse structures. And 
you know, the gentleman was quite frank in telling me, look, I pay an enormous amount of fees to build these things. And then you charge me uh, a ton of, of, of uh, property tax. So it, it, it's sort of disincentivizing his business, which is not what I wanted to do. So we're not looking at a huge category here. It's very specific and a, a limited amount of structures. So Mike, you want to chime in here? I, you might be muted. I'm not sure. Yeah, you're muted. You need to go up and you need to get up to your little gear thing in the right hand corner. Make sure your microphone setting is right, Chris. That's and correct. Check that gear wheel. Make sure your microphone is chosen. I'll just say quickly, Commissioner, um, to your point, I mean, roughly, we're probably talking about um, one to five sites per year at the most that this particular um, structure right. would be uh, would apply to. Right. And again, it's it, it's commercial fees. So we're not talking we got a flat fee for for agricultural buildings for for our farm community farming community right it's 100 correct dollars yeah dick you were instrumental in getting that put forth so this is what's wrong with the flat fee on this one well if it's only one to five maybe that's the way to go well if you look at a chart once you figure out the percentage it will be a flat fee it'll well, be that's true yeah. it'll be whatever that number is there's no calculations required yeah can we hear you yet mike Nope, can't hear you. All right, I'll tell you what, Jay Jason, why don't you why don't you go back to the drawing board here? Maybe that would be my suggestion, even though I don't really like the suggestion. But based on my colleagues' <laughs> comments, might be what I would. I'll reach a compromise here and get us that amount of work that's associated with this. So maybe we can get to that flat fee before we go to a hearing. Sure. Okay. And we can provide similar information as we did with the, the development review fees that we worked on in the spring. So, right. And and I I do understand your your concern too, Commissioner Rothstein, about it being a little bit out of sync with budget. Uh, I, I will tell you that th in this particular incident, this 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 company is either. They've either started or very close to starting their structure up there, and it's sort of time sensitive for him um, in order to get this done. Because if we keep it the way it is, we'd have to, we would have to charge him the fee, and then if we make a decision, reimburse the fee. And I don't think we want to get into reimbursement with these things. That's why I was trying to get this done now, in order to help this. This and I'll, I'll be clear. This is a huge uh, commercial growing business in my district, and they they provide a ton of tax dollars to our our county um, as a result of it. So I hate to get specific. I don't I don't want to put out names, but I get fishing right. up there. <laughs> All, All right. right. Well, we will pull that together, and we'll be back before you. Okay, good. And then maybe get your bureau chief straightened out on how to operate his computer, will you, Jason? <laughs> it seems we're both having problems. So, but I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay. Uh, let's see. Next on our agenda is engineering services for the Panorama Drive Water Main Replacement Project. Another, uh, as Andy. As Andy Watcher, our, our Bureau Chief says, another exciting agenda item. Mr. Myers, good morning. Morning. You know, we always save the most exciting for last. <laughs> so uh, we'd like to request your approval this morning to award a contract to Whitman, Reichart & Associates in the amount of $57,229 for engineering services associated with the Panoranda Drive Water Main Replacement Project. Good morning, gentlemen, and thanks for the plug there on the exciting level of projects that we have. 
Th this is the second in a series of upcoming water main replacement projects planned for aged pipe systems throughout the Freedom Service area. Please recall that the board did approve the Hickory Lane project late last month. As I previously explained, projects are selected by a combination of pipe material, system age, and history of service problems. The Bureau's capital budget program was revised as part of the FY21 budget cycle to include a funding source for these types of water main projects. This project reiterates the proactive approach that the Bureau has adopted to address aging service systems. When we do transition back to in-person open sessions, I will share samples of water main pipes from our breaks and plan projects that, that will better show the issues that are being addressed. Um, the, this project is for, is for design services for the 920 foot Panorama Drive replacement water main that runs south from Maryland 26. The existing water main is an eight inch diameter cast iron pipe system that dates to the early 1970s. The scope of work includes the preparation of bid ready construction drawings, all necessary permitting, as well as bidding and construction service tasks. And again, as, as per the Hickory Lane project, as a further cost effective and cost savings multiple task approach to this project, the overall scope of work will also include the replacement of the water service laterals to the 12 homes on Panorama Drive. Any questions? Questions for Randy. I'll move the Board of Commissioners award the contract for engineering services for the Panorama Drive Water Main Replacement Project to Whitman, Redcourt, and Associates LLP in the amount of $57,229. Second. second. All right, got a motion and second. Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor? And unanimously approved. Good luck with that, Andy. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Mike. All right, that brings us to the end of our agenda items. Um, before we get into agendas, upcoming agendas, uh, anything for open admin or is there any public comment, Chris? Do we have any callers on the line? No commenters. I do have some for open admin. I okay. mentioned last week to, with Mr. Daggett's about uh, the rec sports. And he was going to come back. I don't know if that's on the schedule coming up next week or something of that sort. He, oh, sorry, Commissioner. He was here during the state update. Uh, that's when I thought we'd talk about it and when you didn't mention it. Um, we can get him back on if you want. He's ready to talk to you. I would like to hear what what he's come up with, yeah. Okay. I'll get Sorry. It. Yeah, that's fine. I should have mentioned it earlier, I guess. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't even. Yeah, I didn't even. I wrote it down in my notes at the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, all right. Anything else for open admin while Roberta's getting Jeff on? Mr. Weaver. Yes, I have one I want to uh, bring up here. I was contacted uh, by Mr. Paul Kasak and Sam Chamberlain, uh, Neighbors Nurturing Neighbors, about a program they put together this past year in which they, um, I think Sam does the HSP Gardeners program there and uh, and uh, they grow, grew produce uh, for the people, the homeless and needy out here to provide uh, services. Last, last year, this past year, growing season, they uh, uh, produced, um, I think he said about 1,500 to 3,000 pounds of food or whatever uh, from those gardens. And he was looking at the one in uh, uh, First Fruits, and they produced about a million pounds in uh, Hartford County last year of uh, produce. It's volunteers, uh, volunteer based. And he was looking at a way to try to expand this program a little bit into uh, a program that would uh, uh, help people in the county. Uh, you know, volunteer program. Westminster High School, I know, has their food pantry there uh, to dis distribute food and those type things. So, at presently, we're looking at maybe a way to come up with some uh, uh, sustainability in a program that they could get started uh, in there. And they're looking at maybe parks and rec land or whatever. And I talked to Commissioner Rothstein. And uh, interesting concept I'd like to explore was, you know, in some of the ag remainders out here, uh, we're looking at 
maybe some people who have an agri-manager, and I'm looking at five to 10, 15 acres, uh, maybe have, I want to designate part of that ground for this type of food production and help with the sustainability of it. And maybe for some type of tax credit, some type of uh, a program. And I just wanted to throw it out to get the uh, view of the uh, commissioners on doing something like that. I think the concept is good, Dick. I think we'd have to do a lot of deep diving here as it, as it pertains to uh, how our ag preservation easement program works. Um, that, that, that's where, that, that's where the, the, um, all the work would, would have to occur there because as you know, we've had, or well, we recently had uh, a question on one of our easements with a, with a, with a cell tower. So there's always questions surrounding the ag pres uh, and what the easements what you can and can't do so i think the work would begin there but i'll tell you what i think the intent here is i think it's a great idea on an ag easement it wouldn't it be any problem this is for remainders okay uh, but, yeah but still with the remainders we, with the solar thing we we were talking about there's still work that has to be done to to make sure that that that's you know that's COVID yes, setting. a lot of work here. Yeah. Well, I wanted to throw it out so we could get some background from staff maybe on this, how to pursue it or what to do on it to uh, come back and uh, work on it. This is something, we need sustainability in it. And uh, this has to be something that happens long-term, not just we have some people interested, it happens for two years and fizzles. It's got to be something that, you know, a lot of these landowners, small parcel landowners, want to do something with some of that ground, and they don't know what to do with exactly, but the education from it, uh, HSP does a lot with uh, trying to tell people how to grow stuff. They really don't know uh, how to sustain a garden, how to get it, keep it going, and a lot of these uh, small landowners are looking for something like that. They don't want to make a profit. They want... Um, to focus on some of this. And I'm looking at, uh, uh, I, I told um, Paul we'd get back next week or so, just come up with some ideas where we can go with this, um, and, you know, in the future. And this is one I wanted to throw out that the county may uh, have some input into that they would handle as a volunteer group. But uh, we just would have, um, provide a, a source that could be ongoing that would provide some ground for that by private landowners volunteering to do this. You know, the way, the way I see this is, if we identify a problem that's in our community, what are the solutions to addressing that problem? And one of it is feeding folks that need food. Another is, you know, like did you, you said, the use of ag remainders, uh, appropriately that folks are, you know, still sometimes frustrated on how they're going to use that piece of property. So it's, it's available um, to be used. That may be a, a good opportunity. Another problem uh, with this could be a solution is volunteer hours and opportunities for schools and students uh, in getting volunteer hours, uh, working programs like this, um, education. I mean, there's a whole list of of problem sets that this can be a nice package solution for. So I think it warrants us at least taking a look, a harder look at it. Um, but it comes down to also keeping it simple. And like you said, Dick, how do we sustain it? Because we need both of those to, to get this thing moving in the right direction if we decide to go there. Commissioner Weaver, I think it's a great idea. I think the DNR has something similar with the Cooperative Wildlife Management Hunt Program of Farmers where they allow some people to hunt and harvest on their land. And that's a good type of template that could be utilized on this. I think it's a great idea. And the more people coming up understand farming and its importance, the better off it is. So I, I really love us to explore this idea. Yeah, I think I, th I think you've got the direction, Dick. I think you can take it and run with it. Uh, you know, the other thing is too, even with the solar that we, we've been talking about on these ag remainders, folks had no idea what ag remainders were before. Right. And now we've got a little bit more understanding of what they are and actually how many we have. So, you know, that's important too. So 
I think it's the general consensus that, that appears that, that um, you take that you take that ball and run with it. There's my there's my sports reference since Jacobs <laughs> is on. How you like the way I tied that together? <laughs> Great segue. I hope I do better than Ravens. <laughs> yeah, isn't, isn't that the truth? All right. Um, since Jeff Daggett's is on, let's go to him now. And uh, Dennis, you want to just refresh here? I, I Well, we talked last uh, week about uh, youth sports, uh, recreation sports in Carroll County, following guidelines. What are the guidelines? What are other counties doing? Jeff said he would look and see what other counties are doing right now as far as youth sports. And then maybe we could look at what we're doing in youth sports and if necessary, make changes. If not, then it's all good. But like to know what's going on around the state and what guidelines that we're that we're given so jeff turn it over to you all right thank you commissioners and good morning uh many of the counties around us and uh i'll cite Anne arundel hartford baltimore county they have canceled or greatly restricted youth sports to the degree at which they are not occurring Howard County has put restrictions in place. However, those programs are still occurring. Uh, they have eliminated out-of-state teams coming into tournaments. They've canceled the larger events. They have imposed uh, size limitations on the number of uh, people being able to get together at one time in a program. All of those restrictions are, are certainly within uh, their capability to put in place However, all of those restrictions also exceed the orders that have been issued by the governor. So what we have done to date is to remain consistent with the governor's orders. There are recommendations that have been put out there either directly uh, through those orders, through the Maryland State Department of Health or the CDC, but those are recommendations and not orders. So we've tried to share that information with our rec councils uh, provide that guidance, but we have not, we are not currently issuing any, uh, anything more restrictive than what the state orders are. All right, so what are the state orders for recreational sports indoor? Right now, it's, there are none. It's basically based on uh, uh, building capacity, indoor capacity of 50%. Uh, and when you look at that, you take a large facility, say a high school gym, you look at 50% capacity, that's a huge number. Uh, trying to reconcile that with what the recommendations are, uh, you know, and, and some of these limits, 25 or less, you, know, you could be talking several hundred people at a 50% capacity. We don't have anybody doing anything like that. Right, but if you're looking at 50% capacity, what are you looking at, 50% uh, capacity what the fire marshal says can be allowed in that room? Because then Correct. that's actually taking in spectators and everything else. It's not really taking in people that are practicing sports. So I, I think that's kind of unrealistic to look at it that way. I, I, I'm just. Aren't there limits on 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 the amount of folks that can gather indoor that would that would supersede the, the I thought it was 25. Capacity? I yeah, I it think 25. it's 25. 25 for private gatherings. So. That has nothing to do with the indoor sports. And I, I mean, with the way the COVID numbers are going and, and I mean, I'm just very worried about what, you know, what the spread could be, because let's face it, if we're inside doing sports and the two the big ones that are going on right now would be wrestling and basketball. If I'm doing either one of those sports, running up and down the court or wrestling on the mat, I'm not wearing a mask. And then where I'm in contact with other people and that's fine if that's the way it's going to be done. But, I think there has to be parameters of how many people can be in that in that space at one time. Because, I, so, I mean, having done a lot of sports in my time, I I just know there's it's breathing and all, and it just I just can't see how this stuff's not going to be spread. So at least I think we should limit it to what the indoor uh, um, numbers are, which would be 25. That's just I just think it would be prudent to do that. Jeff, what's your take on that? I do think a number of programs are doing that already. And uh, if I could, I'd like to share, just to use one of the wrestling programs that is operating, share what it is that they are doing. Uh, they have parents dropping off the kids for the programs. They do not, parents do not come in the building at all. So only the children are going in the building. 
they have masks on, face coverings on the entire time, except when they're resting. They have health and temperature checks prior to every session that they go through. Uh, when they have their drills, then they're in different stations. Those stations are spread out uh, six feet or more apart. When they have beginners who are wrestling with each other, and, and this has been one of the greater points of concern, you know, the person-on-person -person contact there, the novice groups, they wrestle with the same partner the same time. They only have the one partner, so they're really trying to limit the contact or the interaction between people. When you have the more advanced groups, now you're looking at a group of four, but it's not expanded beyond that. And, and this program is limiting attendance or capacity to 20 people or less. So they are, as Ed talked about earlier today, you talk about weighing the risks and, and there are some things you can do to mitigate those risks. It's very challenged, challenging to eliminate all of those risks without completely shutting down the program. And, and right. this is what we are trying to navigate through uh, along with those state orders and those recommendations and then have our programs operate accordingly. Right. I'm not interested in shutting down the programs. Let me be clear on that, but I am interested in making them as safe as possible. And what you just described right there seems extremely, uh, you know, well thought out. If, if we could make that the parameters for, let's say, the wrestling programs, because that seems, I mean, that was what you were just talking about. That makes sense to me. And we, we could have some other parameters for, for basketball, but I just don't think we should just let it go whoever wants to come in and, and do the sports or whatever. I, I just, I don't think it can be that way right now. We have to have parameters. I think those are great for wrestling, what you just described. And I don't, I'm not, I don't know. I, I'm not saying we're going to go around and enforce them, but these are what we, we say should be done if you're wrestling indoors. And if you're part of our rec, recreation program, that's all I'm saying. We should also have other parameters for basketball. How many people can be there? Just, just, just the athletes, you know, practicing, the groups, the mask, all that kind of stuff, just so it's out there. People know what we're recommending and actually, I guess we're, what we're requiring, but we're not going to go out there and, and police it. But I just think it has to be out there. I, yeah, Dennis, the I, I, I agree with you. And it sometimes hurts me to say that, but I do. I agree. And um, Jeff, the way you described that, um, it sounds like it was just very well thought out. Like folks got together and said, okay, let's weigh the risk associated with the impact of, of the sport. Um, doing that with basketball would be very important because what it will end up doing is providing expectations for both the athletes and the parents and the community of how these sports are happening because without that, you know, it just ends up being a free-for-all. And you, you're right. Commissioner Frazier, we're not going to be policing this. We're not going to be, you know, the mass police going in there, um, nor do we want that. But if we provide something that's that's doable and we provide expectations, then we're going to, you know, kids are going to get what they need. Parents are going to feel good that they're getting their athletes, student athletes, uh, onto the mats or onto the court, and that's that's all good. But right now, there's no real expectations. Um, so that, that's, that's going to be key. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with it too. Why don't, why don't, what I, why don't I, I was going to suggest we use that as a template. Yeah. The, for the wrestling. Yeah. yeah I thought, wrestling. I think that's great. Yeah. I think use the that you, as a template. Now, there yes. would have to probably be, I, I don't know, a basketball team. I'm trying to think when my grandson played last year, which seems like 87 years ago, <laughs> um, but I was trying to think without all the fans in the stands, because obviously that can't happen. Um, but I think there's typically about eight, nine, 10 kids on a basketball team. Can't be more than that because then you wouldn't be able to. Right. Probably um, 10 would be, but that would still probably meet the 25 or, or less. Well, don't you think Jeff? Uh, a lot of times you'll see a roster of maybe 10 kids on a team. If you factor, two teams in a gym, coaches, assistant coaches, you're at that 25 figure with no spectators. Yeah, I think that's a good template. Yeah, and I do think 25 for in the gym is, is a good number. Uh, just my feeling, I know the gyms are large and all, but you're running around in that gym. You're doing a lot of things. You're being very active. And when you don't have the mask on, not just the projection of, what's, of what you're breathing and so forth. That's why I think 25 is a good 
you know, a good number to, to put on here. I know people have said some of those gyms have six baskets. We could have people playing all those baskets. But then I think you're going to be getting too close, and I just don't like that idea. But the 25, let them run it. But, you know, I think the 25 cap in the gymnasium, I think, is what we need to do for practices. And, again, no spectators. Mask when you're not participating and all, the, all the, th the things you just brought up, Jeff. But I think we should put it out there to the rec programs. This is what we expect. I think the parents would feel more comfortable that way, too, having their – their children go to these to these practices well per, first off i'm not sure there's a another sport besides wrestling that's out there but that's you know my two cents on that um the high schools practices you said uh dennis they're going to start the 14th of december they're scheduled to begin um as the high schools has ccps put out guidelines on what the parameters are around the the, the sports and how they're going to be conducted um, my, I'm sorry. Ahead. My understanding is that next week is when we, the board of ed meets again, and uh, Mr. Duffy is going to come back with the expectations after talking to the athletic directors of what they're, how they're going to do the sports programs. But I, I, they're going to be, uh, from what was discussed last night, I believe, uh, like real practices. Now, what the parameters are under that, I don't know yet. They're, they're going to come up with that. They're not. They're, the discussion was it's not going to be a return to play kind of thing where you have half group here, half group there, just skills and drills kind of things. It'll be more like real practices. But what the parameters are of that, we won't know until the next board of ed meeting when Mr. Duffy has talked to the uh, athletic directors. Okay, thanks. Mr. Daggett, have we had any rec council outbreaks? Uh, I want to be cautious with the word outbreak. So I, I will say there have been some individuals who have tested positive, uh, both uh, coaches, volunteers, and players, and they have been dealt with. They have worked through the appropriate protocol with the health department and contact tracing. So, yes, I am aware of cases. I could not give you a, a number, and, and I would not recognize it as an outcome. To address a problem that we don't have? Well, the, the question or, or the comment about having a template to share with the rec councils and basically the one program, the, the wrestling program that I referenced, they are using that template, which is the existing state order and the recommendations from the Maryland State Department of Health and CDC. Using that information, they, they have tailor fit that to their program. Uh, a basketball program would do it a little bit differently just by the nature of the sport. Right. But that's the template that is out there. That is what we have communicated to our programs. We can get more specific. We can put a, a number, a maximum number of people in a building. Uh, again, that would exceed the state order, but it's within our ability and authority to do that. I'm just a little bit puzzled that if we're, we don't have a problem, why are we trying to put measures in place to solve it? Because we want to be proactive and it's not reactive. I like to head it off before a problem comes. That's why I'm, I'm bringing this up now. I want to wait till, the, till we have the outbreaks. And I just feel it's just the way to handle the situation. So other rec councils besides the wrestling don't have the same measures, but they're not experiencing any infections or outbreaks. You mean other rec councils around the state? They're not doing anything, as, as Mr. Daggett just said. Almost everybody except, I think you said, Howard County, they've closed everything down. We want to try to keep it open. Therefore, I want to be proactive so we can keep it open. I mean, as far as, like, other athletic programs within their borders, they don't have the same policies in place that wrestling has in place. Each of our councils are different and our communities are different. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have a very limited number of gymnasiums available. So while one community may have basketball and wrestling going on because they have a facility available, other communities may have neither because they have no gym available. So th this is a greatly reduced number of children who are participating right now. Normally we have over 45 public gyms available. Right now we have two. So it it's a very limited number of participants. I will say, some may say that child safety is not our priority. I absolutely disagree with that. Child safety and 
looking out for our community is our priority. And it would be incompetent of us if we did not address it while trying to continue to maintain the programs and keep them you know, active because we know that it is healthy for student athletes to continue to participate, but we wanna make it as risk-free or as least risk uh, you know, associated with their activities. Um, so putting processes in place will allow for good expectations of the student athletes, the parents in the community. And like it's been said, I think we're one of the only jurisdictions that's keeping rec programs, you know, afloat right now. So that's, you know, we're, so we're moving in the right direction. We, like uh, Commissioner Frazier said, just be proactive in keeping our student athletes, you know, healthy. But the point I was getting at is we're, we're in process. We have all these students out there and athletes practicing their sport, and we're not suffering from any outbreaks or spreads because of it. And we have a tremendous survival rate of juveniles. I just think we're taking measures to address a problem which does not exist. Nor, nor do we want it to. That's the problem here. That's the challenge because they're – that, let's be clear again, Jeff, you said we had 45 gyms available. There's only two that are operating. So there, there, there isn't a lot going on anyway. So, uh, and I don't think there's going to be, I, the, the, even when the, when the high school sports get back in, those gym times are going to be very limited. So we're not going to be able to increase any of that. So uh, I just, I feel as if there if there is a program out there, that template that that wrestling program is using will allow uh, our, our youth to continue to do whatever they can do, which is very limited anyway, because there's not right. there's hardly anything going on. Um, you know, I, my grandson plays basketball and they're not playing because they don't have any gym and there's no gym space. So if they're practicing, they're doing it outside and that's a whole different uh, set of parameters there. So. I think it's a good move, um, and I don't think it's a big deal because even if we do set those parameters, again, there, there's nothing going on. But if there is, should I think be safe. it should be safe. So if we could use that template, Jeff, even for basketball, even if a program finds a gym, and good luck, I think that's a good, a good template to, to use. And I think um, – I don't know the 20 are we concerned about the amount of folks or not because it, i think it's 25 um and we're not gonna if, i mean i'm not gonna run in and start counting people no but like I think, anybody else is either but. right but i think if we put that number out there people will, will most likely follow it and have a good idea of how many yeah. should be allowed I mean, I, in there i think 25 is a reasonable number so and we can communicate that to the rec council. Now for the two facilities that we schedule, that would be very easy to do. That can be a condition of the permit to use the building. And that would be North Carroll High School and uh, the Robert Moten Center. That becomes a little bit more challenging when groups rent space at a private facility because we do not control that facility. Yeah. Right, I mean, at that point, these are recommendations. You rent it to space, it's up to you. Yeah. Agreed. But I I think we, we need to put the recommendations out there. I think it's, it's part of our responsibility. Okay. All right. Uh, do we need to, I always get jammed up on this, whether we're voting or not on these things. Um, I guess we should formally, I mean, we're, we're still going by the state guidelines, which is what we already said we were gonna do. We're just reemphasizing what they are right? We're not doing anything different. And if it's presented as a recommendation that this would be the maximum number, then that's correct. That would be consistent with the guidelines, but not exceeding them. Okay. Just to repair county clarification of state guidelines. Okay. Can I recommend that we put this on a, an agenda maybe next week, that public discussion, because I think we don't get a lot of blowback on this that citizens involved in the rec councils aren't given a chance to publicly comment or chime in on this. So I'd recommend that we hold off until next week and have this on the agenda 
because it, this is really important for our citizens to weigh in on this. I think we need to make a decision before it becomes a problem. I don't see what the problem is of making decision on this. Again, we've got two gyms or, or three, if you count the two boat gyms in North Carroll that we're working on. Uh, it looks like groups are already putting these measures into place. We're just going to formalize the measures that are already being used around council. I don't see why there'd be any blowback at all. Actually, we're applauding the effort that they're doing. I mean, we're not we're not limiting. We're 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 saying, hey, this is good. And let's continue to keep these programs, you know, vibrant as best we can. Um, you know, again, Eric, it's not about survivability. It's about anybody getting sick. And we don't want these kids or anybody that's going to be going into these facilities at risk of getting sick. So this would at least minimize that. Um, so no, I I, I think uh, we we should just continue and move forward with this. So. Yeah, I, I agree. Re-emphasizing the guidelines, I think, is important here. I think the, where the blowback would be is if we would shut these things down. Then you're gonna then you're gonna see a lot of blowback. But <laughs> maybe. There's already a program operating and they're doing it efficiently then i say kudos and we are applauding them and we're just merely re-emphasizing what the guidelines are to those programs that would find a place to start up if they could and good luck with that because as we said before i don't think there's going to be any gym space anyway but so we could give direction to mr daggett to get these guidelines uh, some type of printed form and can hand it out to the rec departments that are interested in using our facilities. Would that be okay with everybody? I'll make that as a motion. Okay. Yeah, I don't know that we need the motion, but I'll, okay. I'll, I'll because we, we already decided that we were going to go by the state okay. guidelines. Fair and enough. this this isn't doing anything different. All right, so we don't need the motion. Yeah. I just have Mr. Dagan. Let's just, let's yeah. just right. emphasize the guidelines, as Commissioner Weaver said. And we will get that communication out to all of our rec councils today, uh, just emphasizing uh, adherence to the state guidelines and then recommendations as far as the maximum number of people there. And, uh, you know, if we get any negative pushback on that, we'll certainly keep the board aware of that. But I would expect that that will allow the group to continue to do what they're doing, but to do it the right way and to do it safely. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think that's important to note here. We're we're allowing, we're, we're not allowing. We're letting these programs continue to operate, which is very important. So, just just do it the right way. You said it right, Jeff. Well done. Um, we'll make sure that if you're if you're popping on the COVID part of next week's uh, uh, agenda, that we get you on here for any updates that you might have on that. Okay. That's very good. good. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. All Thank right. you. We're still an open admin. Um, is there any, do we have any, I see I've got a caller on the line. You want to unmute that for me, Chris? We have a caller Thank on you, the Commissioner line. Wentz. We're yep. still in public. Thank you, Commissioner Wentz. This is, yep, this is uh, Jim. I, I sent you guys an email actually on this subject this week. Um, I was hoping it would come up in uh, the formal, I guess, session, but I'm glad you guys gave me a chance to speak. Um, in terms of rec sports, um, you, I, I hope everybody realizes they're only really hindering one group here. Um, basketball is being played private in a private setting, in a private gym. Um, it is not being played through rec council. And all you're going to do right now is take that one group and force them to pay to rent a facility if they want to have a competition now. Um, there's been no outbreak. There's been no issues. You guys, we, we did it in the fall. We've done it for – a month and a half now indoors. Um, so I don't, to Commissioner Boucher's point, you made a great point. Why are we doing anything right now if it's not an issue? I know you want to be proactive. But all you're going to do is cost the community money. It's another equity divide. Basketball is being played privately because of this. Kids are still playing, but the ones that can afford it, the ones who can't, can't play now. And you're going to do the same thing now with the one program who has an opportunity to participate, now you're going to limit it. If they can't do a competition now, they're going to have to go pay to run a private space that's going to go up to the state guidelines, which is 250 people. Um, so you, it, it, all you're doing is, is creating an equity divide. Um, and there's no issue. And I wish somebody on this group would address 
the most recent CDC data that came out that showed 24 and 37 percent of kids between 0 and 11 and 11 and 17 increase in emergency room visits due to anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. And now you're going to try to limit them even more. I thank you for taking my comment, but you, you guys assured me, Commissioner Want, especially that you would follow the state guidelines. The state guidelines for youth sports is 50% capacity, 250 people. It is not 25. That's the Maryland Health Department guideline. It has nothing to do with the order. Um, I'm just saying you're going to create an equity divide again, and you're, you're basically doing something to try to solve a problem that doesn't exist. Thank you. Okay, thanks, thanks, Jim. We'll 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 crunch those numbers too, and we appreciate your comments. Uh, we advised that uh, that uh, Jeff Daggett's would be back on next week during our COVID session, so we'll we'll address that at the time too to make sure we've got the numbers right here. All right, anything else? Do we have any other public comment, Chris? None signed up. All right, uh, anything else for open admin? All right, let's quickly go down through agendas. Uh, the week of December the 7th, uh, we have our holiday tree lighting here at 5 p.m. Um, we put a press release out on that. And what what what's the intent of this board uh, when it comes to that? I'm not I'm not sure what we're attempting to do here. Uh, we're asking folks to congregate at this event. Is everybody good with that? Or what are we doing here? Hey, Steve, my, my recommendation is that we, the five of us, have an opportunity to uh, provide season's greetings to the community. It's televised. We light the, the tree, the festive lights, and we put it on social media, and we, you know, give it to groups, even if they're outside. As long as there's cookies, I agree with that. So, just, just <laughs> make sure everyone's on the same page as to what they anticipated there. In, in normal years, we have um, a, either a choral group or last year we had our own special group um, perform. Um, there are no performers. Um, the only music will be pre-recorded music as, as just as people arrive or leave. Um, and the idea was just to have um, each of the five of you get a season's greeting. What, what's Commissioner Rance doing? Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. Now, you could change that any way you'd like. Um, generally speaking, the only people who attend actually in person are some staff members and um, usually family members of the performers. Um, since they're no performers, you wouldn't expect those people. Um, and you could just tell staff, you know, they shouldn't, they shouldn't attend if you like, or you could nominate one of your number to make the season's greeting rather than have all five of you, whatever you think. But that was the intent. It was just really for the five of you to get the season's greeting. Okay, the only reason I brought it up is because the press release does not reflect that. The, That's why I'm bringing it up, because the right, press release- I'm, I'm with press you. Release is invited everyone as, to come to tree lighting. That's why I brought it up. As with most things, it's outside and open to the public as a result, but we can take away the public. It, it just, it was confusing, that's all. I'm for Commissioner Wayans and Chris Wayam doing a little concert there. Okay. I'm not going near him. <laughs> I, I, I'm for the cookies and I can't believe you're not either, Eric, with you and the food thing. I do love the food. I do work for food. I think that no matter what type of thing we do, whether it's a couple of us or whatever, people don't show up. And we don't want to have inadvertently people congregating. I'd prefer if there there could be some sort of recording. You know, President Wance could do a holiday recording or whatever and light the tree. I just think we need to be in conformity of whatever standards that we have placed upon us that inadvertently no matter what we do if we show up there on those steps people are going to show up 
Yeah. yeah, that's that, and that's why I brought it up, Eric. I just I don't care who does it. I mean, I two, three, four, all five of us can be there. We can social distance, and it is outside. Let's be clear. I think we just need to take the emphasis away from we're inviting everyone to join us. That's all. Yeah. That's my only point. We'll do it. We'll we'll talk amongst ourselves, and we'll we'll get it done, and but just take away the uh, the the commissioners are inviting you to attend part of that PR. That's all, and provide the information on where they can see it live or recorded. How's that? Well, it won't be live streamed, but it will be. Yeah, live streaming is tough because we don't have Wi-Fi through these brick walls. Oh, uh, okay. I thought CBS was going to come and do I'm going to throw yeah. a line out the window. <laughs> I was going to say, be recorded next. <laughs> can't you have Gottlieb re repelling down the front of the building with a microphone in his hand or something? I don't know. We've done it before. <laughs> yeah, no. But that might draw a crowd. Yeah, well, then there are going to be people coming. That's true. Okay, we'll take – we'll talk amongst yourselves. We'll, 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 we'll take care of the, of the ceremony. And um, we'll we'll just we'll we'll go from there. Okay. Uh, Tuesday the eighth, uh, Department of Planning work session at nine a.m. Is that a go? I've got hold tentative on here. I would assume that's a go since we're having the hearing this evening. Yes. There it is. I just scheduled some. Okay. okay. Well, unless you guys don't want it to be, I mean, it's totally up to you. But it. it when when Linda, when you guys wrapped up the last of the um, comp rezoning and talked about the next steps, the date was mentioned and everyone seemed okay with it. But if it's not good, just let us know. We'll, we'll well, I think it would be in the best interest to do it. What do you think, Ed? You are, yeah, there's the thumbs up. I think because the, the public hearing comments will be fresh in our minds, we probably should have a work session that day. I don't know how long it needs to be. But for no other reason, we've also got to make a decision on when we're going to do whatever we're going to do decision-wise, too, because we haven't really talked about that either. We just have a planning session. I've had a couple of folks says when, ask me, when, so when are you voting? When are you voting? Right. When are you, what are you voting? So we need, to, you know, we need to talk about that, too. So, so it, unless that con is a big confliction, Dick, we're going to keep it on there. Let us know if it is, and we'll, we can – make amends there even if we start at 10 a.m or something we can we can work around that how about 7 a.m okay you're going the wrong way weaver <laughs> i think there's a farmer right. say. yeah yeah i know okay uh that's it for tuesday december the 8th because at 7 p.m there is no ag center board meeting uh so that can be taken off uh, as a result of the uptick in numbers, uh, the Ag Center Board has decided not to meet uh, that evening. Wednesday the 9th, uh, we have um, MACO, and I don't know if these are actually committee meetings or not, because winter MACO is going on, so we're going to have to get a uh, – we're going to have to see what exactly that is. So we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Uh, the Governor's Workforce Development Board meeting is at 3.30 p.m. also on the 9th, and that's Commissioner Rothstein. Uh, next, oh, we're still on Wednesday the 9th, 5 p.m., Board of Education meeting. That's Commissioner Frazier. I would like to put out there, um, maybe Commissioner Boucher would get an invitation as well, because we're supposed to be going back and forth on that. I mean, I still want to be there. I'm going to be there, but if you'd like to – uh, if we can get an invitation to you, so a link, so you can and tune in and see what's going on, and you know, just to get it started that way. Thank you, Dad. That was a good idea. Okay. Uh, Thursday, December the tenth, eight thirty a.m. is a virtual breakfast. BWI partnership, and that's Commissioner Rothstein. At nine a.m., we go into open session. Typically, as we always do, COVID starts the process. Uh, we have a, a pilot program for Westminster Bond Senior Apartments that we're going to discuss extension or renewal of, uh, extension or renewal of that. Uh, we're going to talk about zoning text amendment for community solar energy generating systems. 
We're going to uh, come back with the 2020 financial assurance plan from the Department of Land and Resource Management. Uh, we have a stream restoration, Brynwood, uh, acceptance of an award for uh, riparian buffer plantings, another stormwater drainage rehab in Village Green subdivision, Bixler Church Road culvert replacement, and that's it right now. 7 p.m. on Thursday the 10th is the virtual MML meeting, and right now three of us are listed in, uh, as attending that. Um, Friday the 11th, there's another Mako thing on there, but I don't think that's relevant either. I think that's just part of winter Mako. So yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get that straightened out with our, with the agenda. And Commissioner Weaver has the podcast and he will be doing that at 6 a.m. <laughs> just thought I'd throw that in there since he wants to have a... I'll be that late. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, the week of December the 14th, Tuesday the 15th, planning and zoning, 9 a.m., Commissioner Rothstein. Veterans Advisory Council at 2 p.m. that day, Commissioners Rothstein and Weaver. Wednesday the 16th, Community College Board of Trustees meeting, Commissioner Weaver at 4 p.m. Thursday the 17th, open session. COVID starts it. We go into our comprehensive annual financial report from our comptroller's office, and that's all that we have right now. That certainly will change. Uh, the 18th, well, the 18th, we're going to, it has another Mako, but I think that's winter Mako. And Commissioner Frazier has the uh, podcast. Uh, I, I don't want to make light of, of the Mako uh, information, but uh, winter Mako is typically the time that all of us gather in Cambridge. And uh, for that two or three day uh, conference down there. So Mako is still doing that just virtually. And that's what you see here. Uh, on these Mako items. And just as a reminder, if you get a chance to tune into some of them, uh, it's it's great. And they're providing recorded sessions on them too. So if you didn't get a chance to do it, we missed one today. Uh, it was at 10 a.m. beyond the 911 call, which was a really good one, uh, was proposed to be a really good one. So you can, you can jump in on those uh, recorded. They provide that opportunity. So uh, make sure you Take advantage of the Mako. Just to let you know, I attended uh, yesterday's Mako session and uh, very informative to talk about the legislative priorities going into the 2021 uh, session. Uh, talked about the hybrid approach that the General Assembly will be taking um, during their sessions and committees, but all votes will be, uh, they will be in person. Um, it, it was good. It was a, a good hour and a half spent on what the expectations are walking into uh, 2021, uh, as far as Mako is concerned. So. Commissioner Fraser, how much time should I allot into my calendar for the BOE meeting? For the Board of Education meeting? Um, maybe four or five hours. I'm going with six, but just saying. <laughs> well, well, just, Rusty's going with 10. This, so. <laughs> sometimes they're quicker, but uh, I mean, uh, Minimum of four hours is, is what I would say. So I need to drink coffee. <laughs> Start at five, end at midnight. Have virtual dinner available, Eric. Virtual dinner. There you go. Okay. Uh, anything else for open admin? All right. If not, I will entertain a motion to go into closed for land acquisition. So moved. Second. Second. All right. I uh, got a motion and second to go into closed. All in favor? And then I'll need a motion to adjourn after that. So moved. We adjourn after. All those in favor? <laughs> All right. So stay on. We'll let uh, Chris will let us know when we're off the air. And a reminder to everyone just wear the damn mask. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs>